ممنوع تاخد أجازة ما ينفعش تشتغل من البيت ممنوع تعزل نفسك مطلوب منك تختلط بالمرضى تستنى الخطر في كل لحظة لكل طبيب في مصر والعالم بيخاطر بسلامته وأمانه علشان حياة ملايين بيواجهوا خطر وباء كوفيد 19 كلمة شكرا مش كفاية إحنا في نوفارد مش بس بنشكركم إحنا معاكم بنشارككم ونشارك العالم كله بإسهاماتنا في جهود مكافحة كوفيد 19 عشان ننفذ التزامنا الدائم بتمكين ودعم المرضى مش إحنا بس كل فرد في العالم بيدعمكم عشان تنجزوا مهمتكم كل واحد قرر يشتغل من البيت كل واحد بيحمي نفسه وغيره بالعزل الاختياري كل واحد بيتجنب الاختلاط كل واحد بيبعد عن أي مصدر خطر ولو محتمل كل واحد بيحافظ على العادات الصحية كل دول بيدعموكم وبيشكروكم وبيتمنوا لكم السلامة Good evening. أهلا وسهلا بحضراتكم النهاردة مشرفينا في Virtual Conference of the Arabic Association for the Study of Diabetes and Metabolism member of International Diabetes Federation uh, and this virtual conference is sponsored by Novartis so um, we appreciate a lot the cooperation with Novartis. Uh, this meeting uh, is uh, uh, having very high caliber speakers from um, more than one place uh, outside Egypt international speakers and also eminent professors from Egypt. Um, we are working for two days, uh, today, Wednesday and tomorrow, uh, Thursday, and we are going to start also tomorrow at 8 p.m. Today we are having uh, five presentations. Uh, let me start with uh, the agenda, Professor uh, Franz, uh, from uh, Denmark. Uh, professor Franz uh, is an eminent um, professor of medical psychology. And then we are having um, Professor Mohammed Hassanin uh, from UAE, Dubai, and UK. And um, Professor Mohammed Nasrallah, which is a professor of and nephrology in Cairo University, and our Lady of Cardiology professor, Gamila Nas, uh, a very dear friend, and she's the professor of cardiology in uh, Swiss Canal University. Um, again, thank you, uh, Novartis, and um, I am uh, also uh, giving uh, appreciation and gratitude to those who are attending the meeting today. And let me start with Professor Franz. Professor Franz is a professor of medical psychology, Southern Denmark University, and he's going to talk about how to keep your patient psychological health. Uh, professor Franz? Yes.
everybody. I would like to thank the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to give this talk about psychological factors that matter in uh, diabetes care. My name is Franz Bauer and I'm affiliated to the University of Southern Denmark uh, and also to Steno Diabetes Center. Uh, My background is a background in medical psychology and as a medical psychologist I'm uh, purely specialized into diabetes. Uh, there are many psychological problems that are relevant for clinicians who work with people who have diabetes. And these problems can be diabetes specific, so only people with diabetes have these psychological problems, or generic. And some examples of diabetes specific psychological problems are, for example, not accepting diabetes, uh, worrying about complications, or having to cope with these long term microvascular or uh, macrovascular complications problems with motivation to take care of diabetes or diabetes burnout. <clears throat> Fear of hypoglycemia is another psychological problem that is quite common. And we have received uh, 1.7 million euro from the EU to look at the impact of hypoglycemia also on quality of life. So that is one of the studies that we are conducting in Denmark right now uh, under the framework of the hyperresolve study. Uh, hypoglycemia unawareness, Fear of self-injecting, of course, is a, is a problem we should uh, consider in clinical practice. It is not a very common problem. So many people who start injecting themselves uh, are afraid of the needle, but the fear goes away often quite rapidly. But approximately 1% of the people with diabetes uh, have a very high fear also after, after months of using insulin injections, for example. Uh, fear of self-testing is often associated with fear of self-injecting and negative perceptions regarding insulin therapy are also a psychological phenomenon that we have uh, studied and that occurs in, in many people with uh, type 2 diabetes who are not using insulin yet. There are also psychiatric problems that occur in anybody that can also make it more complex to take care of diabetes. These problems are, for example, depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, and eating disorders. So imagine that you have type one diabetes and you struggle with an eating disorder like anorexia and you have the idea that you are overweight and that you should lose weight. Then there's an easy way to get rid of some kilograms just by skipping your insulin injections. But we know that young people who do that uh, often have complications in their early twenties. So that's also a very important psychological or psychiatric problem to study. Sexual problems or problems at work uh, or marital problems are also studied by psychologists uh, with a link to diabetes. But today uh, I want to emphasize that these problems not, are not only common, they can be a very important barrier that also hampers good diabetes self-care and leads to suboptimal glycemic control and future complications. To illustrate that, I will focus on depression. That is the best studied psychological problem in diabetes. I'll share some data with you regarding the prevalence of depression. Uh, I'll share data on longitudinal studies with multiple assessments. Um, then uh, I will share information with you regarding the impact of depression in people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, in which way does depression impact health outcomes in people with type 2 diabetes? Then the mechanisms will be discussed. And last but not least, I will end this talk with also what we can offer to people with diabetes who suffer from depression. So there are good solutions also on top of medication. So if we look at the symptoms of depression, we can see that we're not talking about a light disease. Depression is a severe psychiatric condition that has several symptoms. And the two symptoms that are on top of these slides are, of course, the key symptoms, depressed mood that is out of proportion to any cause, and the inability to enjoy life. Uh, then another symptom uh, involves changes in weight, and that can be uh, uh, 
losing weight or gaining weight. So gaining appetite and eating more or not being able to eat. Sleep is impacted by, by depression and also the way people move. So some people slow down, whereas others become so restless that they cannot sit still anymore. Many people with depression have excessive feelings of guilt, uh, guilt in general, uh, but it can also be guilt uh, related to uh, not being able to control uh, good, uh, achieve good glycemic control with your diabetes, for example. Suicidal thoughts are common uh, in people with depression. Problems concentrating and uh, finding it very difficult to come up with uh, decisions. And last but not least, fatigue is also a very common problem in depression and it's a symptom of depression. These symptoms should cause clinically significant distress uh, and impair people's social, occupational uh, and other important areas of functioning. And it should not be attributable to uh, substance abuse, for example, or to another medical condition. We know from lots of studies that depression can be considered as a very common compl complication of diabetes. And that can be either type one or type two diabetes. So if you look at this slide, you can see on the left side, um, the result of studies that have used a diagnostic interview to diagnose depression. So that is the gold standard to assess whether people suffer from a psychiatric condition. On the left side, you can see that 5% of the people in the general population suffer from major depressive disorder, whereas 9% of the people with diabetes were diagnosed with depression. And on top, you can see that the odds are 1.9 higher than the controls. So that means almost two times higher. If you go to the right side of this slide, you can see that 26% of the people with diabetes had an elevated depression score. So that's also two times higher, approximately two times higher than the controls where it was 14%. These studies did not rely on uh, diagnostic interview, but on self-report measures of, uh, of depression. So it is a common problem in, in people with diabetes. This means that if you translate it to your clinical practice, that if you treat 10 people with diabetes a day or in a week, that two of them have to cope with depression. One is suffering from a major depressive disorder, has a psychiatric disease, and one has a subthreshold depression. If we translate this to a global problem, then it means that there are more than 40 million people worldwide who have both diabetes and a comorbid depression, a major depressive disorder. So we're talking about a big, big problem also from a global perspective. Uh, when I was a young postdoc researcher, I was really interested in the uh, impact of complications on depression prevalence. So what I did is I compared the rates of depression in people with no chronic disease with those who had type 2 diabetes only. And what you can see in this slide is that 9% of those with no chronic disease had an elevated depression score compared to 8% of those who had type 2 diabetes. The odds were not increased if people had type 2 diabetes only, but the odds were increased if they had type 2 diabetes and complications of the disease. Then almost 20% of that group had an elevated depression score. So this means that it's not only having type 2 diabetes, but also having to cope with complications of the disease. Um, this is a slide showing the design of the Dawn 2 study, a very famous study that was uh, conducted in more than 15,000 participants worldwide in 17 countries. And what was really interesting is that they did not only focus on people with diabetes, but also on family members and on healthcare professionals and people with type 2 and type 2 diabetes, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, sorry. In that study, um, they did not only look at well-being scores with the WHO5 questionnaire, but also on levels of diabetes distress. And on average, 40% of the people with diabetes elevated, uh, reported an elevated level of diabetes distress. There were considerable differences between countries. So in some countries, uh, the rates were a bit lower, um, but it was an issue in every country. We also know from uh, many studies that Diabetes distress is quite common in people with depression. And we think that if people become depressed, if they have diabetes, they will also suffer, often suffer more from the diabetes. But if they get more 
stress from the diabetes, it is also more likely that they develop depression in a, in a quicker way. So the relation between diabetes distress and depression is uh, probably bidirectional. So I think that having type 2 diabetes will lead to microvascular and macrovascular complications and the burden of having a chronic disease that you have to manage with oral medication or with insulin and the, the distress that comes from having the disease can contribute to depression on top of other life stresses that people can have, marital problems or work-related problems or financial problems. So a couple of years ago, we also wanted to know that whether having type 2 diabetes is also associated to a higher risk of developing a new depression. And in this need analysis that we conducted together with Ari Nauwen, we found that that is the case. So people with type 2 diabetes have a 24% higher risk to develop a depression in the future. A good question that uh, clinicians can ask themselves is, what is the best, the very best predictor of depression in my patients with diabetes or the people with diabetes that I treat? And the answer comes from this study. So if you look at uh, the results of the, the, the POSOP study, uh, this study had three assessments in 2005, in 2007, in 2008. And we found that a high depression score uh, was visible on at least one assessment in 26% of the participants. 14% of the participants had an incident depression. So these were to be considered as new cases of depression. But what was really an important finding is that 66% of those with a high depression score at baseline had a high depression score either in 2007 or in 2008. So that means that a high depression score in the past is the strongest predictor of a depression in the future. So if you know that your patient was ever treated for depression or anxiety, you should follow this up and ask about it uh, also in, in, in new meetings, because it is a, a very important barrier uh, that, that, that's uh, for, for proper diabetes self-care. This is a, a picture of Thomas Willis, a very famous English physician who noted uh, that uh, the urine of people with diabetes tasted sweet. That was one of his, his observations. One of the other observations that he noted down was that Depression was more common in people with, sorry, diabetes is more common in people who had suffered from melancholy or a period of, of sadness, long sorrow. And a couple of years later, ago, in 2006, we published a meta analysis testing the, that hypothesis that Willis already uh, put down in one of his books ages ago. Um, and we had to admit that Willis was right. So <clears throat> people with depression have an elevated risk to develop type 2 diabetes. And that risk is 37% uh, higher compared to controls who are not depressed. So the association between depression and type 2 diabetes is probably bidirectional. Type 2 diabetes leads to a higher risk to develop depression, but the reverse is also true. In this slide, you can see that depression is also associated with a higher risk for mortality. Uh, this, uh, this slide is showing four different groups. And on top of this slide, you can see that the group without diabetes and without depression lived the longest. Mortality rates were higher in those with depression only. And this is the group with only diabetes. And this is the group, lowest uh, line, uh, where people had both depression and diabetes. After 10 years, uh, almost 60% uh, had passed away, died. Uh, and this is adjusted for differences between these groups. So it's adjusted for age, for sex, uh, and baseline complications. So we also conducted a media analysis uh, and compared a lot of these studies and we, had, we concluded that depression is associated with all-cause mortality in people with diabetes. So depressed patients with diabetes have a 46% higher uh, risk to pass away. And for cardiovascular mortality, this was 
39%. So as researchers, we have a big challenge to investigate the mechanisms that link depression with type 2 diabetes. Um, and there are many candidates, but a very important one uh, is poor glycemic control. We know that depression is associated with a higher HbA1c. Um, and that is, of course, a very important risk factor for future complications. We know that self-care of people with diabetes is less optimal. So we know that appointment keeping is less optimal in depressed patients with diabetes. The diet is less optimal. Medication taking is less optimal. They exercise less. And also their glucose monitoring is less uh, optimal, uh, sh shown in this uh, meta-analysis published by uh, Gonzalez uh, et al. in Diabetes Care a couple of years ago. Other potential me mechanisms could be alcohol abuse, <clears throat> increased smoking, uh, poor sleep quality, uh, dysregulation of the stress axis, or higher BMI. <clears throat> Sorry. We know, for example, that uh, visceral adiposity uh, is more likely to develop uh, if people are depressed. Uh, certain inflammatory markers are elevated in people with uh, depression. A higher level of oxidative stress could play a role. And we also believe that genetic factors could play such a role as uh, common denominators of both type 2 diabetes and depression. Now, a little bit more information about the treatment uh, of depression in people with diabetes. So, Van der Veld, Cornelis et al. Um, published a meta analysis of 14 randomized controlled trials that studied whether depression in people with diabetes can be treated. And the answer is yes. And they found the largest effect for psychotherapeutic interventions. And usually these interventions consist of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'll tell a bit more uh, later on about that. Depression can also be treated with uh, medication, pharmacological treatments, and there the, the effects uh, were moderate. And what was found is that sertraline also uh, lowered HbA1c. Collaborative care can be used to uh, treat depression in, uh, in people with diabetes. Um, and I'll tell a little bit more about collaborative care in the next slide. <clears throat> a very big clinical problem is that there is an underdetection of, uh, of depression. And because of the un underdetection, there's also an under-treatment, and that uh, under-detection and under-treatment is approximately 50% to 60%. So those who go to the doctor with diabetes and major depressive disorder are not recognized as such as being depressed in 50 to 60% of the cases. Um, Thompson et al. thought, well, let's re-educate primary care physicians and learn more about what depression is and how it should be recognized and treated. They conducted a randomized controlled trial to see whether that worked, but the answer is no, uh, that is not beneficial. Physicians know what depression is, they know how to treat it, um, but often in clinical care, time pressure is huge and it is often not discussed. That is often the case. That is my take of, uh, of this study. We also studied recognition rates in the Netherlands by nurses who were very interested in psychology actually. And we found that those who had a high depression score, only in 25% of the cases, the nurse noted down that there was any psychological problem. It could be a note like patient is stressed or patient doesn't feel well, mentally well, uh, or patient feels depressed. That was counted as a recognition. So only 25% in, in the Netherlands. In 1994, the St. Vincent Declaration recommended that the psychological well-being of people with diabetes should be monitored, like we monitor HbA1c. And we tested that in a randomized control trial. So we, the control group received standard diabetes care, and the intervention group received standard diabetes care and monitoring of their emotional well-being. So they completed a short questionnaire, uh, and uh, uh, the score was discussed with the nurse in, in, uh, in an open discussion. And we found that in the intervention group, uh, approximately 20% uh, of the patients were referred to a medical psychologist, and that could lead to many different conversations. In some conversations, uh, it was uh, a major depressive disorder was diagnosed. In other meetings uh, with the medical psychologist, the patient explained that uh, he or she had lost an important person and was mourning 
but also that there was no need for psychological support, that there was a lot of support from family members and from friends, and that that person considered the stress and, and the depressed feelings as, as part of life. So in the end, we concluded that the emotional well-being was better in the intervention group after 12 months, and that they were also more satisfied with the care provided by the diabetes nurses. Uh, but we found no impact on HbA1c in this particular study. Then <clears throat> the famous study from the USA, which is named the Pathway Study. And um, step care in a pathway study, uh, an, an important element is monitoring of emotional well being and then offer step care. First starts with a light intervention where people have to read uh, or go to a website to learn more about depression and kind of self treat it. And then step by step, intensify the treatment if the symptoms are still there. That worked well in, in, in the pathway study. So that's published in the archives of general psychiatry. So the intervention group did better than the control group. But what is also very interesting is that the financial impact of a successful depression intervention was also quite big. So the net economic benefit of this de depression intervention was almost a thousand dollar per patient because um, People with uh, uh, successfully treated depression went back to work uh, way earlier and consumed less healthcare. So this is a famous study conducted by Pat Lossman, and he studied whether we can treat depression in people with diabetes with cognitive behavioral therapy. And in cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, people learn to think differently in a more rational way, in a more helpful way uh, about themselves. And, and about life or about diabetes. And more than 80% of those who were treated with CBT had a remission of depression compared to 30% of the control group. And even six months post-treatment, 70% was still not depressed anymore compared to still 30% of the control group. So this is an effective way of making people stronger being able to cope with depression and get rid of depression symptoms, also in people with diabetes. We also tested a web-based CBT therapy program a couple of years ago, together with Frank Snook, who developed this. And we found that this is possible. You can also treat depression with online therapy these days. So there's no need to go to a psychologist office. People can also self-treat it at home behind their computer and do some homework and learn more about their symptoms, how to treat it. Uh, so we published that study uh, in diabetes care. And uh, we also found a decrease in diabetes specific emotional distress in this study. Uh, but again, HbA1c stayed the same in this, uh, in, in this study. Another way of treating, so that's a third way on top of medication of treating stress and depression in people with diabetes, and that is mindfulness based therapy. So in CBT, people um, think, learn to think in a more rational way and change their thoughts. In mindfulness therapy, people learn to just observe their thoughts and relax. Uh, also to plan uh, experiences in their life where they, they focus on really what they're doing. So go out for a walk and try to focus on the present moment and walk or eat a nice meal. So live a more, more mindful life, so to say. And that was also a successful way of reducing stress uh, and improving quality of life and reducing depression in people with diabetes. That's, that is shown by this randomized controlled trial. I'd like to uh, end with this uh, conclusion. So we know that depression is common in people with diabetes. We know that it is a risk factor for type two diabetes and its complications and that people with depression and diabetes die a couple of years earlier. So it's a very unfavorable combination. At this stage, we do not know whether successful and intensive treatment of depression prolongs life in people with diabetes. That's currently unknown. That's not really well, well studied. Um, the mechanisms are also understudied. So we need no studies where we really focus at the biological mechanisms and also the behavioral mechanisms that could link depression and diabetes. And in these studies, we could also focus on, on subtypes of depression, atypical depression or melancholic depression. It could be really uh, relevant. 
I also think that many countries need more well-trained medical psychologists to conduct this research, but also to work in the hospitals and support uh, the endocrinologist uh, and the nurses um, to treat the psychological problems in patients with diabetes. And, and of course, also in primary care uh, medical settings. We also need uh, a master training at universities in medical psychologies in, 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 in many countries. Um, and psychological factors should also be incorporated in the training of nurses and doctors, of course, because they're so important because diabetes care is self-care. Um, and the last conclusion is uh, that depression in people with diabetes can be treated by medication, of course, with CBT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and with stepped care. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Frank. It's a very clear presentation. Um, let me go through um, uh, this, some questions. I invite you all to write your questions or even the faculty, if they have a specific question, they can mention it or to write it uh, for us. Um, perhaps we can take the first question, Frank, about the, um, the, the role of uh, the psychotherapy versus antidepressants. I saw from the questions people asking about when would you use psychotherapy? When would you use an antidepressant? And which antidepressants yeah. would you use? Yeah. Uh, all people are different. So some patients will have a preference for medication and others uh, not. So I think it's also dependent on patient characteristics. Um, and then with, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, so... Um, I think I should refrain from giving specific advice regarding medication, uh, but we know that, that several different medications have been tested in, in people with diabetes. Um, personally, I think that uh, the psychological interventions uh, are not only treating symptoms, but can make people stronger. So if you learn uh, from a nurse or from a psychologist or from a doctor uh, to cope with problems in life, uh, through CBT, or if you learn to relax uh, in, in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, uh, you're becoming a stronger person. Stress is a normal part of life, uh, but if stress levels become too high, then they can impact our brain and can, can make people, uh, in the end, depressed. So personally, I, I would recommend uh, psychological care or psychological treatment as a first step. Uh, but of course, if people are severely suffering uh, and suicidal, then uh, antidepressant medication can certainly have a, a very important role. 
okay. like fluoxetine or sertraline or or uh, yeah. yeah i mean the presence of psychology support is quite strongly recommended in many places unfortunately it's very much underused yep. there's a question here about when would you consider in a newly diagnosed teenager the psychological support um i, I think every diabetes team uh, that is treating young people but also that is treating adult people with either type 1 or type 2 diabetes uh, should have a psychologist on board Today, I've, I've been talking about depression, uh, but you also have uh, people who are suffering from an eating disorder, for example, and that's a bad combination if you also have diabetes. Uh, we know that sleeping disorders are very common in diabetes and can also are associated with uh, poor glycemic control. Uh, so psychologists can strengthen the medical team and True. sometimes find solutions how to approach a patient uh in 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 terms of of therapy uh but also to treat psychological problems that is uh that that would be my recommendation in your presentation you clearly um shown the the bi-directional um link between depression and diabetes yes so in people with diabetes we are very frequently um missing the signs and the symptoms of depression. Yes. Should we adopt in our daily practice, like a, a, a risk, a depression risk questionnaire, or certain things to detect the person with uh, not the bang door depression symptoms or signs? Yeah, yeah. If you look at uh, um, different guidelines, for example, the the guidelines from the ADA uh, or the guidelines in in the Netherlands or Germany. They all or ESPED guidelines for young people with diabetes. They all recommend um, monitoring of emotional well-being, including depression, uh, but also disturbed eating. Um, I think it, for the medical team, it is good to be aware what is going on in the mind of the person with diabetes, and uh, a high score should be discussed. So it should not be regarded as a diagnosis, of course. Uh, but as a as a way to quickly get to know the person who has diabetes, uh, so these psychological problems can really be a barrier. Uh, what I realize is that it is time consuming. So the challenge is to do that in a in a in a smart way. Um, but if we combine, if we use smartphones, for example, uh, to do the assessment, so patients can already complete it at home, and if we do it in such a way that the physician already has the scores uh, in, in the patient chart, then physicians and nurses need a small training how to discuss the scores and of course be able to refer. If you recognize a depression and you cannot refer a patient uh, to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, it becomes unethical. Or maybe we can use the, the negative point of patients waiting to get to the clinic room uh, yep. do the assessment and convert the negativity into something positive to for the person to self-assess themselves and then we can end up with the risk score yes um, let me just uh, go through some of the questions yeah um, some of, of i mean i i guess with the COVID era we you cannot avoid the question of the stress related to, to COVID disease specifically in people with diabetes any uh, quick points on this? Uh, sorry, I missed that question. Uh, it, the people are asking about this, the, the mental stress in diabetic uh, COVID in the era of COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, there is a, a, an interesting publication uh, uh, in diabetic medicine. Uh, James Pate is one of the authors, um, together with Tim uh, Timothy Skinner. But I did not have the opportunity uh, to read the paper. Uh, but my impression uh when i look at different websites of uh, people with diabetes is that that it, it is a strong concern for many of them uh, uh, people with diabetes uh, are probably more vulnerable for uh, the virus so the virus can can have a, a more negative impact uh, so what i expect is that that the stress levels are higher in people with diabetes related to COVID. Uh, Frank, you've alluded that you're not a psychiatrist, so you didn't want to commit yourself to discussion about 
the pharmacological agents for antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question, maybe you can just reflect on it, uh, on uh, uh, can we depend on the, uh, the, the, the likes of deloxetine for that people use for diabetic neuropathy to treat depression as well, or, yes. uh, or amitriptyline that sometimes people use? Yeah. Um, would that be enough? Or, I mean, hit, well, treat we, neuropathy and treat depression at the same time? Or what would be your um, reflection? Yeah, well, uh, we know that duloxetine uh, is also uh, an, uh, registered as an uh, antidepressant medication. So my, my take of it is yes, that, that, it, that should be possible. Um, my impression uh, from clinical practice is, is also that, that many psychiatrists uh, try different medications and see whether they work. So if a certain medication does not work, then they try another uh, medication. Uh, but I'm not sure whether there is a, a certain sequence for people with diabetes, uh, which medication should be yours, used first. I'm, I'm not aware of that. I've, I've never seen that. Sure. Any questions from our uh, co-faculty, if, um, the, if they have a question for Frank before um, we move on to the next part? Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. It was a brilliant discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.
Okay, so we'll now move to the next uh, presentation and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, a very dear friend and, uh, and colleague, Professor Ines Shaltout. I don't think anyone in Egypt who is interested in the field of diabetes doesn't know Professor Ines, a professor in Cairo University and the president of the Arab Association for the Study of Diabetes and Metabolism. And today, uh, Professor Ines will uh, cover the very important discussion about the intensification of treatment, whether we start with monotherapy or dual therapy um, as the verified trial. Professor Ines, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mohammed, uh, a dear friend and colleague also. Um, I'm going to talk about the reimagining diabetes standard of care. The VERIFY uh, trial. Um, trial published recently in September 2019, an important uh, trial, uh, about reimagining diabetes standard of care. This is the rationale behind reimagining diabetes and the agenda and what is the new evidence of early treatment intensification, the VERIFY trial, and uh, newly published ADASD uh, updated consensus report mentioning VERIFY trial by name. Uh, we have uh, either to stepwise approach in diabetes management to start with a single oral medication and uh, the patient will disappear for some time and come again uh, uncontrolled to increase the dose of this oral medication then to uh, add another oral medication then to start to add insulin this is called stepwise approach leading to clinical inertia or to start with uh, early uh, combination with uh, uh, combination of oral anti-diabetic medication and to have a stable glycemic control below the target uh, of hemoglobin A1C. And then an actor elitnin, either uh, the stepwise approach or to go through a strict control from the beginning. These are um, the reasons for uh, early combination therapy. Lee Ben Fakar for early combination therapy. I will have the combination therapy targets multiple pathophysiological defects in diabetes. We know that we have eight or omnia octet, eight target organs and pathophysiological defects in diabetes. When we use a combination therapy. We will target three or four or five of the pathophysiological defects. Also, we can target the pathogenic abnormality, not just uh, reduce the hemoglobin A1C, and also early treatment intensification prevent or slow the decline of beta cell function. Um, since type two diabetes is a progressive disease. And there is early onset of comorbidities. Um, the current treatment with metformin and then a PG metformin was standard is again high as both the hemoglobin A1C below the required glycemic control. uncontrolled type. Hal ana other a PG be treatment intensification or be early combination therapy. Uh, the verified trial was published in the Lancet in September um, 2019 to verify the role of initial combination therapy in patients with type 2 diabetes, a double blind randomized multi center trial, a five year trial. Uh, in newly diagnosed type 2 di diabetes, but current being an early combination therapy with vildagleptin and metformin versus sequential metformin monotherapy. 
لما احب اقارن ال verified trial هقارنها ب trial شهيرة جدا اللي هي UKPGS UKPGS in 1998 um, was studying newly diagnosed diabetic patients ده يمكن a similarity between UKPGS and verified trial ان الاثنين اشتغلوا على newly diagnosed patients ولما قارن ال verify من other very famous trials in diabetes, whether type 1 or type 2, هنلاقي إن أغلبهم كانوا بيشتغلوا على patients uh, in hemoglobin A1C is higher from 7% to more than 9%, ولكن ال verified trial يمكن كانت ال trial الوحيدة اللي اشتغلت على patients with hemoglobin A1C from 6.5 to 7.5%. Uh, it was uh, a multinational uh, trial, multicentric trial. Uh, 34 countries were included, uh, 254 centers, and 2,001 uh, people with diabetes were included in the beginning. Uh, the study design uh, showed the uh, age of uh, 18 to 70 years, body mass index 22 to 40 kilogram per meter square. The hemoglobin A1C, like we said, 6.5 to 7.5 percent. 50 percent of the patients were having normal uh, GFR and uh, 50 percent were having mild impairment of uh, the renal function. Um, the type 2 di uh, diabetes was diagnosed um, uh, the prerequisite can in the patients do you newly diagnosed with maximum 24 months of uh, diabetes and all were drug naive uh, and maximum metformin was given for four weeks but no other medication uh, was given to the patients. Um, this is race. Uh, Caucasian patients were uh, around 600 in both groups. Uh, other races also were included. And these are the patient's characteristics, females, age, type 2 duration uh, in months, uh, median of around three months, and hemoglobin A1c uh, 6.7 in both groups. Uh, body mass index 31 in both groups. The weight also is uh, 85 and 84 kilograms. The GFR were, like we said, 50% were, ha had normal kidney and 50% had uh, mild impairment of renal function and the smoking status were also screened. This is the study design. There was a run-in period, three weeks uh, run-in period. Uh, our week and fee metformin was given 500 milligram uh, once per day. Uh, the second week, uh, 500 milligram twice per day. The third week, 1,500 uh, milligram were given per day. And those who uh, could tolerate this dose of metformin were included in the study. And there was two arms. One arm uh, had early combination therapy of metformin and vildagleptin, and the other arm uh, only metformin with added placebo as an initial monotherapy. Period one, Macan Shiliha duration muhaddad. Like the patients can be stable of period one with halolohom hemoglobin A1C, call it a patients. Hemoglobin A1C above 7 for two successive readings can be in the initial treatment failure or can be in period 2. But in some of the patients, they didn't fail. Machine, benefits, treatment, whether early combination therapy or uh, initial monotherapy. In the اللي كانت بتاخد ميتفورمين بلس فيلدا جليبتن زي ما قلنا لو كان في two successive readings of hemoglobin A1C more than 7% uh, بيعتبروا failed uh, ولكن بيستنوا على الكومبينيشن for six months uh, 
وهنشوف ايه الـ يعني ايه الكونسبت ان هم يتسابوا فور 6 مانثس بالنسبه للمجموعه اللي هي نوت فيلد كانوا بيتسابوا على الميتفورمين وفيلدا جليبتن اطول وقت ممكن طول ما هم مظبوطين لما بيحصل تريتمنت فيلير بيبتدي العيان بيتحول على بيزل انسولين بالاضافه الى الكومباينيشن اوف ميتفورمين اند بيلدا جليب بالنسبه للمجموعه الثانيه اللي كانت بتاخد ميتفورمين انيشال مونوثيرابي لما يكون في تو سكسيسيف ريدنجز اوف هيموجلوبين اي 1 سي مور ذان 7% They move to a combination therapy, which is metformin and vildagleptin. Well, of course, can be percentage of these patients they didn't fail and they continue on a monotherapy of metformin. With that, we can see that there can be a group that started from the beginning with combination therapy, which was saved, which was corrected by the second group that started with combination therapy after failure of metformin. زي ما قلنا كل ال ال في period two fail to maintain hemoglobin A1C less than seven percent for two successive readings اتزود عليهم ال basal insulin. What are the main results and safety results? These are the analysis uh, undertaken. Uh, primary analysis was the time to confirm it initial treatment failure. Uh, the secondary analysis, the time to second treatment failure and safety and tolerability of both monotherapy and combination therapy. And there was um, data about educated cardiovascular events. There are more data um, coming in the in the near future, and it's done. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about a time to confirm it initial treatment failure. And let me ask you: Do those with type two diabetes benefit from having combined therapy at the beginning of their pharmacological treatment or not? Yeah. 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 With all the benefit results, early treatment combination strategy significantly reduce the relative risk to time uh, to initial treatment failure by uh, 49% or 50% versus the initial monotherapy. Yani elayanin elkenu akhado early combination treatment can al fi el initial treatment failure failure. 50% من ال patients اللي ابتدوا بال initial monotherapy بالmetformin بس. وده ال mean duration of glycemic control في المجموعة اللي أخذت metformin كان about three years والمجموعة اللي أخذت metformin build a glyptin combination from the beginning كانت five years وبعضهم كمان كمل بعد ال five years وبالتالي your patients have Two extra years of glycemic control with early combination therapy. We can the can the main stay of verified trial and the main conclusion of verified trial. Let me take a calm on second treatment failure. Let's ask the question: Do those with type two diabetes benefit more from having combined therapy at the beginning of their pharmacological treatment? Compared to sequential additive strategy, يعني ال and current the مجموعة اللي أخذت the combination therapy from day one, the مجموعة اللي أخذت the combination therapy after failure of metformin monotherapy. وجي كانت results results بتقول إن the relative risk for time to second treatment failure. During period two, was significantly reduced by the early treatment combination therapy, 26% and the monotherapy. يعني كانوا أقل failure of treatment في ال في second treatment failure بتقريبا 26% في المجموعة اللي أخذت early combination therapy عن المجموعة اللي أخذت early monotherapy of metformin alone. 
آه الحقيقه ان كل الريزلتس دي كانت آه in favor of early combination therapy في كل السب جروبس سواء كان المجموعه اللي كانت الهيموجلوبين اي 1 سي بتاعها اكتر من 7% او اقل من 7% المجموعه اللي كانت البي ام اي اكتر من 30 او اقل من 30 الديفرنت ايج جروبس الجندر السموكينج ستيتس كلهم كل السب جروب اناليسيس كان in favor with early Uh, combination therapy. Now, when we talk about weight, we know that the metformin is uh, weight reducing. There was no uh, significant difference in weight between the two groups, the group that took initial combination therapy and the group that took initial monotherapy. This is Uh, what about the safety events? Uh, of course, the most important thing to strict blood glucose control is the hypoglycemic events. Well, hypoglycemic events for early combination therapy can be 13 uh, events. With the initial monotherapy, it can be 9 events. The other uh, side effects, as we have seen, serious adverse uh, events and other adverse events, All were comparable between the two groups, the early combination therapy or the initial monotherapy. In uh, the nine cases or nine events of uh, hypoglycemia and the 13 event of hypoglycemia, they were grade one event, يعني, um, no severe hypoglycemia, hasalet, and mostly were mild events of hypoglycemia. Uh, those who uh, discontinued the medication were low in both groups and comparable. يعني الناس اللي وقفت الدواء uh, سواء كانت وقفت لوحدها أو وقفت due to adverse events كانت قليلة في المجموعتين المونوثيرابي والinitial combination therapy. برضو الـ adverse events زي ما احنا شايفين في المجموعتين كانوا تقريبا similar في المجموعة اللي أخذت متفومن مونوثيرابي أو فيلدا متفومن. لما نيجي لتالت حاجة تعمل لها analysis اللي هي الـ educated cardiovascular event هنلاقي أن كان في educated cardiovascular events numerically كانوا 30 Um, event in case of uh, early combination therapy compared to 44 uh, event in initial monotherapy with metformin. وبالتالي كانت أقل في المجموعة اللي أخذت early combination therapy ولكن these results were non-significant. زي ما احنا شايفين الأرقام كانت أقل ولكن كانت uh, non-significant. Uh, لما نتكلم على الـ summary and the clinical implications هنقول إن الـ early combination treatment halved the risk of time to initial treatment failure versus monotherapy and the median time to failure was three years في uh, initial monotherapy with metformin compared to five years في early combination therapy with Velda metformin. Uh, كمان الفرق بين المجموعة اللي أخذت early combination therapy مع المجموعة اللي أخذت uh, combination therapy after failure of metformin uh, كانوا أفضل 26% في المجموعة اللي أخذت early combination therapy and both approaches were safe and well tolerated سواء كان mono uh, therapy أو early combination therapy الاثنين كانوا safe and well tolerated and the conclusion of verify The strategy of an early combination treatment approach with vildagliptin plus metformin in patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes significantly and consistently improves long-term glycemic durability compared with metformin monotherapy. طيب هل الكلام ده قال في guidelines أو بالفعل قال في guidelines أو ال consensus ال AGA وال ESG 2019 قالت أن في little evidence about the approach of early combination therapy ويمكن دي كانت hint بس على ال verified trial ولكن بعد كده في ال diabetes care it nushered 2019 update طبعا ال consensus اللي كلنا عارفينها قالت إيه؟ قالت أن في uh, there is limited evidence for initial combination therapy 
وقالت ان الفيلدا جليبتن افيكاسي ان كومباينيشن ويز ميتفورمين فور ايرلي تريتمنت اوف تايب 2 ديابيتس اللي هي الفيريفاي ترايل بروف اديشنال انفورميشن طلعت نتائج اكتر من اللي كان بيتقال عليها ليتل ايفيدنس في الكونسنسس اللي قبلها. ذا انيشال كومباينيشن lower the rate of secondary failure of glycemic control الهيموجلوبين A1C طبعا اللي هو اقل من 7 versus metformin alone or the sequential addition of metformin and vildagliptin يعني اتكلمت على ال verified trial وقالت ان كان في lower rate of primary treatment failure و secondary treatment failure كمان and these results have not been generalized to other orals than vildagliptin. يعني it's not a class effect, it's not a, a group effect, it's not an effect of oral anti-diabetic medications, ولكن these results were particular to vildagliptin. وقت قال ان احنا initial combination therapy is a new concept in cases of type 2 diabetes, ولكن you have to consult your uh, patient وتفهمه أنا لي بدي combination therapy uh, from uh, the beginning. Uh, بشكر حضراتكم شكرا لكم. دكتورة إيناس المحاضرة كالعادة أكتر من ممتازة وإحنا كلنا كالعادة بنستمتع بمحاضرات حضرتك. وانا بشكر جدا يعني ذا ليدي اوف ديابيتس في مصر الدكتوره ايناس شلتوت ذا بروفيسور اوف انترنال ميديسن اند ديابيتس فاكولتي اوف ميديسن كايرو يونيفرستي ذا بريزيدنت اوف ذا ارابيك اسوسيشن فور ذا ستادي اوف ديابيتس اند ميتابوليزم اند وي وي جاست يو نو هاف تو ستارت ذا ديسكشن Um, there, we have a question now uh, about uh, the monotherapy versus combined therapy. Uh, is it, you know, is, you know, is it, uh, uh, you know, it's better or what's your recommendation about this? Is this one of the, the questions we received from the floor, Dr. Ines? Um, <laughs> عندنا في الـ guidelines uh, concept اللي هو individualization of treatment يعني مش كل العينين كمان أنا ببقى حابة أن التارجت بتاعهم يبقى less than 7% أنا عندي group of patients ببقى محتاجة أن الـ hemoglobin A1C target بتاعي يبقى أقل من 6.5 ويبقى عندي strict diabetes control Uh, ال patients دول هم newly diagnosed uh, patients يعني الكلام ده يمكن قبل حتى ال verify قلنا الكلام ده من 2012 ال newly diagnosed patients ال patients with no uh, risk for hypoglycemia no repeated hypoglycemia no hypoglycemia unawareness ال patients without comorbidity على ال liver او ال kidney او ال heart uh, ال patients uh, طبعا ما يكونوش geriatric patients ال patients دول Uh, لو انا استخدمت لهم تريتمنت which is not causing severe hypoglycemia uh, كنا بنحب ان الهيموجلوبين اي 1 سي تارجت بتاعهم يبقى اقل من 6 ونص وان انا ابقى حتى من 6 ل 6 ونص فده قلناه من 2012 ويمكن هو ده نفس الكونسبت دلوقتي واحنا خلينا ناكد تاني ان احنا uh, كل وقت بيقضي عيان الدايابيتس ويز strict control of his blood glucose and ده بيقلل من ال complications on the long run وطبعا حضرتك هتقول لنا على ال cardiovascular disease بيقلل لي complications whether macrovascular complications or microvascular complications يبقى انا لو اقدر اعمل العيان بتاعي strict blood glucose control وده يمكن زي ما قلناه من بدايه 2012 وهو في 2019 بيتاكد لنا بعض ال trials واللي احنا طلبناه من نوفارتس ان هي تو ابديت اس ويز يمكن هيطلعوا داتا بيتهيألي على المايكرو فاسكولار كومبليكيشنز كانت المفروض ان هي هتطلع في كوارتر 2 من السنه طبعا uh, يمكن uh, مشاكل اللي بيمر بيها العالم هتاجل شويه النتائج ولكن احنا منتظرين نشوف الايفكت اوف ذيس ايرلي تايت جلايسيميك كنترول على الكومبليكيشنز Oh, this is amazing. Uh, I have two other questions, Dr. Ines. Uh, the, the next 
what are the ranges of initial glucose measurements allowing the use of this early combination metformin and vindagliptin? Uh, هو احنا مش هنتكلم على بلاد جلوكوز قوي احنا بنتكلم على هيموجلوبين اي 1 سي يعني البلاد جلوكوز متغير يوم بيوم ولكن احنا بنتكلم على هيموجلوبين اي 1 سي ويمكن هنا الفيريفايد ترايل اتكلمت على الجروب اللي هي الهيموجلوبين اي 1 سي بتاعها من 6.5 ل 7.5 uh, عندنا طبعا لو احنا هنرجع للجايد لاينز كلها بتتكلم على 7% هيموجلوبين A1C ان انا ببتدي بمونوثيرابي ميتفورمين وان انا بستنى ثلاث شهور واشوفه لو ما كانش العيان هيوصل لي اقل من 7% المفروض ان انا تو اد اون انذر اورال انتي ديابيتيك ميديكيشن ولكن هنقول ان احنا عندنا نفس الجايد لاينز من زمان بتقول لنا ان انا اقدر تو جو تو ا مور ستريكت هيموجلوبين A1C ريدكشن لما اقدر ولما العيان يبقى سيف ان انا تو جيف هيم تريتمنت هنقول ويز نو ريسك اوف هايبوجلايسيميا ويكون العيان ما عندوش كوموربيتي ممكن تعمل لي مشاكل. ف ات از ا نيو كونسبت وبعدين احنا مش احنا اللي بنقول الكلام ده ده نازل في الجايد لاينز من 2018 و2019 و2020. Uh, the last question, Dr. Ines, what about the initial treatment with other combinations? We don't have any trials, even if the AGA said that we can't do this on other medications, whether it was other medications of the same group or other oral anti-diabetic medications, and it said that this is اتعمل في الفيريفاي ترايل على الفيلدا جليبتن متفومن وبالتالي احنا مستنيين اذا كان في ترايلز اتعملت على الاذر جروبس اوف انتي ديابيتيك ميديكيشنز او الاذر كلاسز اوف جي بي بي 4 انهبيتورز. اه ثانك يو فيري ماتش بروفيسور انس شلتوت ذا بروفيسور اوف انترنال ميديسن اند ديابيتيس ذا فاكولتي اوف ميديسن كايرو يونيفرستي ذا بريزيدنت of the Arabic Association for the Study of Diabetes and Metabolism. Um, now uh, I have the honor to introduce the, our uh, next speaker and uh, actually he's one of the uh, world figures in endocrinology and diabetes and uh, uh, we uh, are proud always of him. This is Professor Mohammed Hassanin of endocrinology from England. And we're very happy to have Professor Mohammed Hassanin, the Associate Director for Postgraduate Diabetes Education at Cardiff University, the United Kingdom, the Chair of Diabetes and the Ramadan International Alliance. Uh, yes, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Mohammed Hassanin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Gamila, for your uh, kind introduction. Thanks for uh, Professor Ines uh, to, for the invitation and for our uh, sponsors, Novartis, uh, for extending the invitation to me as well. So I would like to follow with what um, Professor Ines have mentioned on the, uh, the, the, the clinical trial and look into three short cases on how can we apply these um, recommendations and the guidelines, as well as the new clinical uh, trials on everyday practice. Uh, whether it's applicable or not, that is what we will see together now. So um, let's just proceed uh, with the first case scenario. So there are very simple case scenarios. There is nothing difficult or, com or complex in them these are typically patients that you see every day in your clinical practice. So my first case is a teacher of 55 years of age. He's a male. He has history of um, hypertension and ischemic heart disease for the last two years, ischemic heart disease, hypertension for longer. Um, his EGFR is a bit reduced to 65. His HB1C is 8%. His body mass index is 28. Um, he's currently on dual therapy of uh, metformin and glycoside 
uh, as well as treatment for the hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and a statin. And let's focus on the glycemic control. Let's not get into other issues. So from a glycemic control point of view, um, what should we do? So I show you here the algorithm um, of the ADAESD, which was uh, published initially in 2018 and got recently updated. And as you can see here, in 2018, they are talking about people with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease. If this is the case, then regardless of the HP1C, we need to consider adding either a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist with proven benefit or an SGL-2 inhibitor with proven benefit. Which one do you choose? The consensus, if, the, if it's more of heart failure or kidney problems, then it's an SGL-2. If it's more of an atherosclerotic problem, then it's a GLP-1. Um, when they updated the recommendations um, earlier this year, January of this year, they looked into not just the established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but those with very high uh, risk, which in my mind, this is actually disease, because as you can see here, they're talking about people with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, with coronary or carotid or lower extremity artery stenosis of more than 50%. So there is already um, an angiogram and been done either on the coronaries or the lower extremities or some sort of a Doppler that established that there is 50% or more of stenosis. Anyhow, that was the ADA and the ESD recent recommendation and recent update for the recommendations. I personally have the pleasure of being part of the very recently published Emirates Diabetes Society recommendations for the management of type 2 diabetes. And here we have looked into risk categorization. We've looked into the various guidelines that is available and we've modified them to the local requirements. So someone like our patients that we've just talked about, a 55 years old male with established ischemic heart disease, what we said here is either this or a target organ damage, then they are considered as very high risk. If they don't have an organ damage, but they have diabetes for over 10 years and they are aged over 50 years and they have more than two risk, two or more risk factors, they are considered also as very high risk. So that would apply to our case. And the recommendation is to start either a GLP-1 or an SGL-2 with benefit regardless of the HP1C. So this is the, uh, an important point. When, so the HP1C here is not a factor in the case that I've presented. And then if they fail, we can intensify the treatment as you all know. But I think we have focused massively on cardiovascular outcome trials. And I think we have to put everything into context. When you look into the cohort of patients of the MPREG or the CANVAS program, or the DECLARE study, how many of them apply to everyday patients? For MPREG, it's 92% who would not be eligible for MPREG uh, for empagliflozin treatment. In the CANVAS program, it was 80% would not be eligible from the cohort published in the BMJ uh, uh, earlier last year. DECLARE, because it included many people with multiple risk factors, it was considered to be 60% would not be eligible for this. So while a lot of the scientific discussion is talking about the cardiovascular and the renal patients, let's not forget that's not the majority of our patients, at least in the early stages. If you apply the same to the NHANES data of 240 million persons with diabetes in the States, you will and look into the cohort of patients that's been taken part into these excellent GLP-1 receptor agonist cardiovascular outcome trials, you will find that they would range from as low as 8% to as high as 22%. So clearly, 
the vast majority of our patients are not necessarily patients with existing cardiovascular disease or extremely high risk that would necessitate this automatic addition of an SGL2 or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. I looked into uh, a study that we've published by Professor Ines is a co-author in the Dia Ramadan study, which is on glyclozide MR. And I just want to highlight that of the baseline characteristics of our patients with a mean age of 54, with a mean duration of diabetes of 5.4 years, there was only 6.3% with established cardiovascular disease. There was about 28 to 35% with either dyslipidemia or arterial hypertension. So risk factors are there, but established cardiovascular disease is not necessarily the majority of our patients. And this is something that we need to remember and we put into context. So let me go to the second case, which is more of what we see frequently in our practice. This is a person who is 45 years of age, male, hypertensive, with a BMI of 29, with a normal renal function, and this person is already on a reasonable dose of metformin of 1,500 milligrams. Of course, he's also on the other treatment for his other conditions, such as the antihypertensive and the lipid lowering, considering that the person has hypertension. So when I think of this person risks, I see that his diabetes duration is only four years, he's under 50 years of age, he has two added risk factors. So when I apply our scheme that we have or that we've produced from the Emirates Diabetes Society, that here is the patient under 50 years, under 10 years of diabetes duration with um, two risk factors, two added risk factors that put this person on a moderate risk. He would still be on a moderate risk if his diabetes duration to increase or if his age to increase, but with less risk factors. So this is important to remember. And this is typically the type of patient that you would like to say, okay, I'm already on metformin. What should I use of these classes of drugs? They're all available to me. How do I choose? Well, you need to think of the efficacy of the drug you want to choose, the risk of hypoglycemia, the impact on weight, the cost, and of course, the baseline HB1C. Because if the baseline HB1C is above 10, then the recommendation is to go to insulin, according to the guidelines. Otherwise, you can think of any of these equally according to the individual case. And all of these parameters, including, of course, cost, is one of the important parameters. Of course, you would intensify the treatment, but you would avoid having two incretin-based therapies together. And then eventually, if the person is not well controlled on triple therapy, then you would intensify the injection or initiate an injection. So clearly, the ADA and ESD are not disputing what we should do, but they are just highlighting as what Professor Ines in her presentation mentioned. She has mentioned the word three months, and this is what we all unfortunately ignore. We don't wait for three months, we wait for three years to add the second line drug from monotherapy to dual oral therapy. And if they're on dual oral therapy, we wait for seven years to add the third line. And then eventually to add insulin, we even stay for a similar time on a person already on triple therapy. So that is something that's been highlighted in the studies that have been published over the last uh, six, seven years. And we really need to stop this inertia um, specifically when we know in some sectors of therapy that our patients might not be available to see frequently in our clinic. You've seen this slide by Professor Anas. I'm not going to repeat it again. All I'm saying is this is what we want to do. We want from very early in the therapy, use whatever weapons you have, lifestyle, education, and the right combination therapy to get your patient in control and remain in control for as long as possible without this yo-yo 
situation, which is not really helpful. Why is that? Because it does matter. It does matter. When you look into the difference between this person, whose HB1C was in the mid eights, going down to roughly about 7.5, which many of us would say, it's so good, it's okay. I don't need to have intensive treatment. Well, when you have this sort of okay, this is what you end up with. After five years, as been shown in this published by Kunti et al, uh, published two, three years ago, that you talking about higher rates of myocardial infarction, higher rates of stroke, higher rates of heart failure, and higher rates of the composite cardiovascular events. So it does matter, and we should not really um, have this sort of uh, uh, attitude of it's okay. No, we need to get good control for our patients. Because what we've seen from the verified trial is that the, the lines separate quickly. What are these lines? This is patients with events. What we're talking here about is macrovascular events. Yes, the hazard ratio was crossing the line. Yes, the p-value was not significant, but I don't think that anybody would be happy with higher numbers of cardiovascular events in their cohort of patients. So really, this is important for us to remember. So I would like to move to my last case, which would apply very much to the discussion that you just had with the verified case, because this is a new um, diagnosis. This is a 39 years female with type two diabetes. She has no history of other comorbidities. Her HB1C is 8%, BMI is 28, non-smoker, LDL is 110 with a total cholesterol of 165. How should we treat? Well, there is no doubt that metformin need to be part of that. But as uh, Dr. Ines mentioned, here is the update of the ADA for 2020 where they published their, um, their, 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 their points. And here they're saying the initial combination of the DP4 inhibitor vilvagliptin with metformin was shown to, prov to provide a lower rate of secondary failure of glycemic control to HB1C um, above 53, which is seven, versus metformin alone, or the sequential addition of metformin plus vilvagliptin. So it's not just about the, 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 the molecules, it's about the timing of the molecule. That is really what is quite important. It's quite important for us to remember that it's not just the Vilda or metformin or another drug. It is the molecule and the timing of the molecule. That is really quite important for all of us to remember. So that's why they are saying is that we suggest have that discussion. They were not strong enough to say, we recommend changing the guidelines. They did not say that, but they stopped short from saying this by saying, consider it, think about it, discuss it with your patient, because after all, you can gain longer duration of good control. The added years with good control can give the person the confidence. And of course, I agree with Professor Ines, we need to see the impact of this on microvascular complications. Macrovascular complications, we know it might need longer time, but with the microvascular complications, it could be much shorter. But for the treatment here, the number of events, it is not really about whether the person got the second drug or not. It's about the timing. Initially, you combine or you add on when required. And that's the difference between the early combination and the initial monotherapy that required the addition of the drug a bit later. So you see here, there was no failure in five years, 60 months, there was no failure on the early combination. While obviously in the other groups, there was a need to intensify and to add therapy as you go. And we've seen this in ADOPT trial. We've seen this before, many years back, in 2006 in ADOPT trial, that when you use monotherapy, you will have good control for a number of years, but then gradually, whether this is a glitazone 
or a metformin or a sulfonylurea, gradually the control will need to be um, intensified again. So it's a matter of why can't we do something to remain here rather than we end up here and then start to try to get it down again and whether this is successful or not. So if I were to go back to this case of the early diagnosis, this is a person under the age of 50, newly diagnosed with one added risk factor, this person is a low risk. So what we use for low risk or for moderate risk or even for high risk is any of these. You choose what you think and what Verify is saying to us, it's not just about the class. I mean, we, for cardiovascular outcome trial, we say the drug with evidence. We always say, keep saying the word drug with evidence. So I might as well use this if we are to use the early combination as per the previous question to Professor Ines is which one would you use? I would say the one I have is the one with evidence. So all the time we have to balance things. We have to balance things between the timely and the effective and the stable glycemic control to improve glycemia and prevent complications versus the risk that the drug can have, such as hypoglycemia or weight gain, or maybe it's uh, the impact on other factors as well. So this is really what you need to think of. And I really like the fact that our patients, often with the combination therapy, don't feel it's two drugs. Because the availability of the combination in a single tablet is there. The psychology, and we've heard Frank talking about the psychology for our patients, certainly we know that the psychology of multiple drugs make people not so happy, but when they see that they are on single tablets, it may improve adherence. And adherence is obviously linked to the uh, HB1C, which we all are keen on. So my take home message is really quite simple. Cardiovascular and renal risk quantification is essential for all our patients. And this is important to do and important to follow and we have good evidence. But this is not the majority of my patients. We need to provide a treatment that is tailored according to the patient profile. The profile could be the comorbid comorbidities, could be the risk of hypo, could be the weight, and could be the finances of the individual, as well as many other factors. When we are thinking of all of these points, it's really important to apply evidence-based medicine. The choice of therapy needs to be backed up with evidence. We are sometimes blamed for the physician inertia, and we need to try to overcome this, because this inertia could lead to avoidable morbidity and mortality. Our patients with diabetes, they already have an, a, a, a risk that we want to reduce and we don't want to increase that risk by our own inertia. Early intensification is an important concept, concept uh, as mentioned by the ADA, that we should consider for many of our patients and discuss with them and see whether this would be the right choice for them or not. After all, the ideal treatment for diabetes, you need to think of all of these parameters. Efficacy should be high. Weight should be either neutral or indeed to help losing weight. Risk of hypo need to be abolished or low. It needs to obviously to address the problems of diabetes, including fasting and postprandial hyperglycemia. Need to be simple to administer with a very low profile of side effects with evidence and with cost effectiveness. Um, I would love that someone would tell me which drug is this. Um, I'm sure you will all try to think if it does exist or not. Thank you all, and I look forward to any questions that you have now. Thank you.
الاليجنت تو طبعا هي بتكمل المفهوم بتاع اسال حضرتك هل انتوا بتستخدموها فعلا في ال في العلاج ولا انتوا يعني ستيك تو ذا جايد لاينز لان طبعا لسه الجايد لاينز ما قالتش كلام واضح على الايرلي كومباينيشن ثيرابي انا معاك يا دكتوره ايناس ان the guidelines did not strongly put that forward that it must be done um, but it's certainly a point of consideration um, some colleagues um, love early combination love to address the aggressive um, intensification from the beginning and some are waiting to see whether the patient gets out of control to add another drug so I mean, maybe in my hospital, because we are a referral center, we normally see the complex patients that need multiple therapy or injections, or they have complications. I don't necessarily see many of the initial diagnosis. This is usually done in primary care. And another point, which is a bit different than the practice in, in Egypt, where it's mostly re reliant on the person himself booking an appointment, they need to come to us anyhow to get their medication. And we see them um, usually within three months. The maximum is six months because we cannot prescribe longer than six months. So we are not concerned about the patient disappearing. In fact, it's the opposite. The patient wants to come more frequent. We don't have the slots for the appointments to see them that frequent. And that was the same in UK where it's a, 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 a uh, and the NHS, an insurance-based system where the patient need to come to the doctor to get their medication anyhow. So I'm not concerned about losing the patients. But the concept is tempting. I have to admit that the, the robustness of the study is nice, it's good. It would be lovely to see, obviously, some um, uh, similar studies as well to move in that direction. Uh, في سؤال طبعا هو يمكن مش مش يعني جاي لحضرتك uh, what is the most safe treatment for diabetes with pregnancy uh, is basal uh, insulin safe during pregnancy or not I don't mind taking it I do the antenatal clinic for the last 20 years um, in pregnancy um, there is only two classes of drugs insulin and metformin sulfonylurea uh, glavenclamide is approved but because we know it has a high rate of hypoglycemia, we very rarely use it. So uh, for type 2 diabetes or for gestational diabetes, we tend to use metformin initially. And if the person gets out of control, we add on insulin. Which insulin depends on the profile of the person. If it's hyperglycemia all day, then we use both, basal and prandial. If it's only fasting hyperglycemia, we use the basal insulin. Uh, في سؤال يعني هو يمكن يبقى معانا احنا الاثنين نقول الاجابه I think before combination therapy in diabetes uh, type 2 behavior therapy and lifestyle medication should be at start what's your opinion يعني هو ال lifestyle موجود from day one to the end يعني lifestyle ما وقفش ومالوش علاقه بالميديكيشن هو لازم يبقى موجود ايه راي حضرتك دكتور محمد بالتاكيد ويمكن دي كانت السلايد تشينج من الاولدر فيرجنز اوف ذا جايد لاينز اللي كانت بتقول استنى ست شهور على لايف ستايل لكن الكارنت سيتويشن بتقول دونت ويت اند بس ذا لايف ستايل از كونتينوس اتس فيري امبورتنت ذات وي ادريس ذا بيهيفير اوف ذا بيرسون بيكوز if they don't address their behavior, they will need not just monotherapy or dual therapy, they will need uh, intensive therapy with insulin within a short number of years. Um, thank you, Professor Mohammed, uh, for the sake of time. وإحنا مسهرينك وعارفين إن أنت عندك الوقت متأخر قوي. في الامارات وخليني let me introduce my uh, dear colleague uh, uh, professor محمد نصر الله
Professor Mohammad Nasrallah is a professor of nephrology, Cairo uh, University. Um, Professor Nasrallah, he came on the management of diabetes uh, with uh, CKG and which uh, medications are safe for uh, CKG diabetic patients. The important thing is Dr. Mohammad uh, Atfad. Allah Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. I'm going to give you a story that happened to me about about four or five years. We were in a meeting like this, and it was one of the meetings that it was called by the pathologists and nephrologists. And then it was a question about metformin. And is this the case? يعني هل نستخدمه في عيانين الكلى ولا لا؟ ف معلش انا مش عارف الصوره واصله ولا لا لان انا عندي طيب فالحقيقه واحنا انا ساعتها الجايد لاينز ساعتها كانت بتقول انه عيانين الكلى ما ياخدوش متفورمن خالص الا لو الكرياتينين لو الكرياتينين بتاعهم مش شكل ازيد من واحد ونص ولا واحد وثلاثه رقم كده ما اعرفش جابوه منين وكانت احنا كنفرولوجيست عندنا بلاثره من الداتا يعني كتيره جدا جدا فروم سو ماني اوبزرفيشن ستاديز احنا اتس فيري سيف تو يوز المتفورمن Lots of experience, lots of data. ولما قمت قلت الكلام ده ام احد السادة الافاضل الدايبيتولوجيست زعل مني جدا 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 وقال لي انك انت اللي بتعمله ده ما يصحش ابدا وعيب عليك وكان عايز يوم يضربني يعني وقال لي انا لازم اضرب الراجل ده باللفظ فعلا يعني قبل ما يموت العيانين ليه؟ علشان عايز يستخدم ريتفورمنت في عيانين الكلى. حاولت اتناقش معاه بالعلم ولكن هو كان مخه فيري ستيف قوي في حته الجايد لاينز. الجايد لاينز مهمه لكن اللي انا عايز اقوله ان ساعات الايفيدنس بيبقى موجود والجايد لاينز بتبقى بطيئه شويه على ما تتبناه. ف انا مش عارف بيور سبوت مش لو يسيبوني بس حريه اكتر في الحركه طيب اوكي. ف فالحقيقه انه احنا عارفين ان اباوت 40% من عيانين التايب 2 ديابيتس هيجي لهم كيدني ديزيز. و المورتاليتي في الناس دي از اباوت 35% على مدار ال10 سنين اللي بعد ما يجي لهم الدايباتيك نفروباثي والمورتاليتي دي بتقل حوالي 30% لو العيانين دول كانوا ماشيين على متفورم عشان كده المتفورم احنا بنعتبره من الادويه اللي ما لهاش علاج وقعدت افكر هذا الدكتور اللي كان زعلان مني جدا علشان انا عايز اكتب متفورم العيانين عندهم كرونيك كيدني ديزيز لو هو راجل فعلا دايباتولوجيست يشوف عيانين كتير المفروض ان يكون بيشوف آآ آآ على الاقل 500 عيان مثلا جديد في السنه متوقع 200 منهم يجي له دايباتيك نفروباثي او يكون عنده دايباتيك نفروباثي يبقى المورتاليتي ريت بتاعتهم بحسبه سريعه كده متوقع تبقى اراوند 70 هيموتوا من 200 دول في خلال 10 سنين يعني في السنه هيتوفى سبعه كان ممكن يبقوا خمسه بس لو كنا ايدينا وفكرنا وبصينا على الايفيدنس اللي موجود ف One of the main things I'm going to be defending today is the use of metformin for عيانين الكلى. والحقيقة علشان لو صل لي هدنة ووو ووو تفاهمات ونقدر نقدر نكومانج the patients. Let's ask. Let's ask ourselves. It's not a question. A dozen of questions. يعني it's not a question. أنا أسألهم من النهاردة من الأسئلة المشتركة اللي بنشوفها كتير بين دكاترة الكلى والسكر ونحاول نوصل لإجابات يكون فيها consensus و و نتفق فيها مع بعض. أنا مش هبقى بتكلم على المانجمنت أوف دايابيتس طبعًا لأن ده موضوع ما يخلصش يعني ده علم يعني ولكن خلينا نتكلم بس على الهايبرجليسيميا بس بسرعة المانجمنت أوف جليسيميا في العيانين اللي عندهم كرونيك كيدني ديزيز. هل هو في فرق بين عيان الكرونيك كيدني ديزيز الدايابيتيك وعيان الدايابيتيك اللي ما عندوش كرونيك كيدني ديزيز؟ من الناحية النظرية طبعًا في فروق كتيرة جدًا الميتابوليزم بتاع كل حاجه ريليتد للدايابيتس بيتغير بمجرد ما العيان يبقى عنده كيدني ديزيز من اول انسولين ريزيستنس اللي بالعكس 
اللي بتكريت انسولين كليرنس والجلوكوجينيسيس اللي بتاثر ال جي اي تي موتيليتي الابيتايت فوميتنج والجاستريك امتينج والحاجات دي كلها ممكن تؤدي الى هايبوجلايسيميا او فلكشويشنز في الليفل بتاع البلاد شوجر والابزوربشن بتاع الدراجز اتسترا وطبعا الدراج ميتابوليزم كله بيتغير صحيح احنا دايما بنفوكس على الميتابوليزم بتاع الدراجز بس الحقيقه لا الكرونيك كيدني ديزيز بيأثر على اولموست افري سنجل اسبكت ذات وي كان ايماجن في الباثوفيسيولوجي بتاع الدايابيتس والفارماكولوجي بتاع الدراجز اللي بنستخدمها طبعا زي ما قلنا الهايبوجلايسيميا العيانين دول ار فيري برون تو هايبوجلايسيميا ودي من الهول ماركس اللي دايما بتخلينا نفكر هستخدم ايه؟ ما هو العيان في الاخر لازم هيظبط سكره. ساعات آه نبقى عايزين نبعد عن دواء معين علشان زعلان منه زي مثلا الميتفورمين هستخدم ادويه ثانيه تعمل مور هايبوجلايسيميا which is even much more serious and I will show you in a minute. السؤال الثاني آه وده شفته على فكره بعض الناس سالوه في الشات سؤال هو ايه الجلايسيميك تارجتس بتاعت عيانين الكلى اللي عندهم سكر؟ زي ما الدكتوره ايناس كانت بتقول من شويه هو الموضوع مش موضوع بقى جلوكوز وهنقيس السكر الفاستنج والبوست برانديال يتهيألي خلاص بطلنا نعمل كده لكن بقينا بنبص على اذر ميجرز اللي منها الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين، عيب الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين في عيانين الكلى انه بيتاثر وبيتغير بحاجات كثيره قوي. related لل altered erythropoiesis في العيانين دول. فعيان الكلى لو خد erythropoietin او حديد او B12 الجلايكيتد الموجلوبين هيبقى فولس في لو يبقى شكله حلو وهو سكره مش متظبط والعكس طبعا blood transfusion بيأثر ونفس ال presence of urea in the blood alters ال 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 level بتاع الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين وال pH and so on. وبالتالي it becomes rather inaccurate throughout history بقى حاول الناس ان هم يدوروا طيب على حاجه احسن اعتقد دكاتره السكر ما بيسالوش السؤال ده لان السؤال ده بنتساله كتير من دكاتره الكلى الفروكتوزا مين والجلوكوزا مين وبقول لهم الكلام ده يا جماعه مش عايزين دكاتره السكر يسمعونا واحنا بنتكلم عليه علشان ما يضحكوش علينا لان هذا الكلام يعني ادم قوي وبقى عامل زي اللي بيتكلم على انسان الكف يعني Uh, these measures, even though they could have been useful if they were studied properly on time, but they were not studied properly in terms of in the outsole, in the Arab, and he level, and he target the uh, effect of the adjustment to the things on the outcomes, the availability of it, etc., etc. Don't even talk about them. But in fact, what is happening now? You guys are all aware of the cell monitoring of blood glucose. وده قد يكون افضل في عيانين الكلى كمان علشان زي ما قلنا الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين ما يبقى ليه عيوبه وربما الكونتينيوس جلوكوز مونيتورين. طيب ايه التارجتس؟ ودي من الاسئله برضو اللي شفتها على الشات من شويه كانت بعض الافاضل الحاضرين بيسالوها. والحقيقه الاجابه قالتها ضمنيا دكتوره ايناس وقالها ضمنيا الدكتور محمد حسن القبلي ان هو يو هاف تو لوك ات يور بيشنت از ا هول هو عنده سكر بقاله قد ايه؟ هو ايه الريسك بتاع المايكرو فاسكيولر ديزيز اللي عنده؟ ايه الريسك بتاع المايكرو فاسكيولر او الكارديو فاسكيولر ديزيز اللي عنده؟ وورث نو و عيان الكرونيك كيدني ديزيز البروفايل بتاعه كالاتي غالبا غالبا ما بقولش دايما ولكن غالبا عيان التايب 2 ديابيتس ابو ديابيتيك نيفروباثي ده عيان عنده سكر بقاله شويه كتير. طبعا احيانا بيبقى العيان عنده كرونيك كيدني ديزيز من الاول ويجد عليه سكر ويبقى السكر لسه جاي دي قصه ثانيه لكن غالبا الاثنين لما بيجوا مع بعض بيبقى السكر في اغلب العيانين اكتر شويه فده عيان ما قالوا عنده سكر بقاله شويه وعنده هاي ريسك اوف هايبوجلايسيميا وعنده هاي ريسك اوف ماكرو Vascular disease. I mean, the kind of that they have very high risk cardiovascular disease patients. Who, by definition, who are a lot of them, they have already a microvascular disease. So they are high risk. Not just high risk. They are also getting the morbidities already. Okay. So we are going to do intensive glucose lowering so that we can reduce the rate of progression of the kidney disease. We know that it will increase with time. They will begin with a little hyperfiltration, and then they will. عنده جريد 1 البيمينوريا اللي هي بنسميها مايكرو 
وبعدين ماكرو البيمينوريا اند سو اون طيب تعالى نمنع البروجريشن لان احنا نعمل انتنسيف جلوكول فلورينج وي اول نو فروم موست اوف ذا ستاديز انك وين يو دو ذس الحقيقه ممكن فعلا تقدر تقلل قوي المايكرو فاسكولار ايفنتس وممكن فعلا وي هاف ايفيدنس ان ذس ويل لور ذا بروجريشن اوف كيدني ديزيز حاجه حلوه قوي ولكن الحقيقه ولا المورتاليتي ولا الكارديو فاسكولار ديزيز غالبا بي بي بيتاثروا قوي ربما ربما يكون ده بسبب الهايبوجليسيميا اللي بتحصل في الديفنسيف ايتنج والويت جين والكارديو فاسكولار كومبليكيشنز والاريميا اللي بتيجي مع الهايبوجليسيميا اتترا ولكن هايبوجليسيميا كانت دايما بتبقى عقبه في ان احنا نوصل لبروبر اوتكمز في العيانين بتوع الكلى وعيانين السكر ان جنرال الحقيقه طيب التارجت في الاخر ايه في عيان الدياليسيز It is around 6.5 to 8.5. أكثر من كده وأقل من كده المورتاليتي بتزيد. خلي بالنا عيان الدياليسيز غالبا عيان very high risk of cardiovascular disease وغالبا already عنده cardiovascular disease uh, uh, يعني pre-existent يعني. ف, ف we should be careful where they are very prone to hypoglycemia و uh, hypoglycemia unawareness. So we should be a little bit careful. وطبعا زي ما اقول لك لكيت الهيموجلوبين بيتاثر بالليفل بتاع الهيموجلوبين والبلاد ترانسفيوجن والاريثروبوتين والحديد والحاجات اللي احنا بنديها للعيانين ولكن خلينا نقول انه موست اوف ذا ستاديز ذات وي هاف شو ذات ذا ليست مورتاليتي از ان ذا رينج اوف اراوند 6.5 تو 8.5 موست اوف اس ويل كيب ذوز بيشنتس اراوند 7.5 تو 8 8.5 لو اكبر في السن شويه من كتير منهم بيبقوا عيانين كبار وفريل طب في النان دياليسيس بوبيوليشن حاجه تكسف الحقيقه وي دونت هاف Good studies that were specifically performed on non-dialysis chronic kidney disease patients. أغلبها بتبع observational studies أو حتى interventional studies تعملت على general diabetic population وطلع فيهم كم واحد chronic kidney disease وتعمل عليهم post hoc analysis. ما نقدرش نأخذ منه data قوية جدا ولكن ولكن we extrapolated data بتاعة non-diabetic patients بتاعة non-diabetic sorry diabetic non-kidney disease patients. Uh, اللي هو كل ما العيان يبقى اصغر في السن وليس برون لهايبوجليسيميا وليس كارديوفاسكولار ديزيز ومور ريسنتلي تايجنوز ديابيتس كل ما تبقى ميال ناحيه انك تيجي ناحيه الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين يبقى قرب السته ونص والسبعه علشان تمنع البروجريشن بتاع المايكروفاسكولار ديزيز وكل ما العيان يبقى اكبر ومور فريل وعنده كارديوفاسكولار ديزيز وهايبوجليسيميا برون كل ما بتزقه ناحيه الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين يبقى اعلى ناحيه سبعه ونص طيب هل الجلايسيميا تارجتس دي هتاثر طيب على البروجريشن اوف كيدني ديزيز؟ اكيد يعني اي نو ذات ذا ايفيدنس لوكس هيتروجينس من الشكل بتاع الفيجر اللي قدام حضراتكم ولكن ده تاني لانه دوز ستاديز ور موستلي نوت ستاديز ذات سبيسيفيكلي لوك ات كيدني ديزيز از ان اوت كوم يعني طيب نيجي للسؤال اللي بعد كده السلفونايل يوريز احنا زي ما اتفقنا هجاوب على 12 سؤال كتير قوي لما بقعد مع اصدقائي وزملائي واساتذتنا من دكاتره السكر بيثاروا تثار هذه الاسئله هل السلفونايل يوريز ينفع نستخدمها؟ يعني لا بحبك ولا بقدر على بعدك يعني ايه ما بنحبهمش ما حدش بقى يحبهم قوي علشان الهايبوجليسيميا بس هي ادويه فيري افكتف الحقيقه They are very effective drugs ينزلوا السكر قوي ورخاص جدا ومش نفروتوكسيك والهايبوجليسيميا هي مشكلتنا الاساسيه فيهم خصوصا مع اللونج اكتنج دراجز فالهايبوجليسيميا هي المشكله الاساسيه وخصوصا العيانين دول بيجي لهم هايبوجليسيميا وبيبقى ممكن مع الدراج يبقى ريتين تبص تلاقي الديت جلوكوز فورجع جا له هايبوجليسيميا ثاني ويروح العيان يجي له انذر هايبوجليسيميا ات هوم ذات سم تايمز كان بي فيتال طيب Uh, دي حاجة I need to address just a few drugs specifically لأني بلاقي إنه في بعض ما زال موجود عندنا uh, حاجات عايزة بس تبقى updated اللي هو الكونسبت القديم بتاع إنه الأمريل هو الأفضل لعيان الكلى الإجابة إن ده مش صح uh, الأمريل ليس الدواء الجلايمابرايت سوري عموما is not the best drug is not the best sulfonyl urea for patients with chronic kidney disease in terms of انه اقل عرضه بيعمل هايبوجليسيميا الكلام ده مش صح الكلام ده 
طلع الحقيقه فروم سم فيري اولد امريكان ستاديز لان هم ما عندهمش جلايت لازايت في امريكا فلما قارنوا جلايميفرايد قارنوه بالدواء الجلايبين كلاميد اللي مشاكله كتيره قوي في الهايبوجلايسيميا فقال لك ده احسن الحقيقه انه اف يو ار جوينج تو تشوز اي سالفونايل يوريا مضطرا واسفا وده بيحصل كتير تعيان كلا جلايت لازايد از ذا انسر اتس نوت جلايميفرايد ديفينيتلي فزي ما قلت احنا وي تراي تو افويد الجلايبين كلاميد لايميفرايد is not contraindicated but it's not the best is a stadium lab we use small doses we try to avoid it at a gfr below 30 and we take care of hypoglycemia if we use something the glyphosate unfortunately it's been for a long time not in Egypt which is the mini diab it's a short acting drug with a very low risk of hypoglycemia if it wasn't the glyphosate the most important thing the nephrologists like to use it in their eyes because it's also a test of the eyes dialysis it's pretty safe تستخدم دوز قد ايه طبعا ببتدي من فيري سمول دوزز وي تايتريت ابورد بنلاقي عيانين كتير جدا ماشيين على دوزز اب تو يمكن 120 ملي جرامز واكتر كمان وبيغسلوا فيري ستيبل نو هايبوجلايسيميا وذس از اكسبتبل طبعا موست بيشنتس ويل نيد اونلي هاف ذا ريجولار دوز طبعا عيان كل ما بيحصل كلا بتزيد كل ما بنقلل الدوز ونمونيتور بس انا قصدي انه ذير از نو ابر ليميت از لونج از ذا بيشنت إذا كومبلاينت بيشنت بيعمل بياخد الدواء بتاعه وبياكل وبيعمل بروبر فولو اب وما بيحصلوش هايبوجلايسيميا جاست تايتريت ذا دراج ابورد سلولي كيرفولي وبقول كيرفولي تحتيها 10 خطوط وزي ما انا قايل فوق تاني اهو اتس ا لاف هيت ريليشن شيب احنا ما بنحبش الادويه دي في عيانين الكلى ولكن اذا اضطرينا كيرفولي ذا انسر از جلايكلازايد جلايكلازايد مش موجود الكليكيدون كان دخل مصر شويه وبعدين اختفى مش عارف راح طيب which is the safest drug بقى من موضوع الهايبوجلايسيميا احنا من ساعة ما قعدنا تقريبا بنتكلم عن هايبوجلايسيميا I think the answer is PPP4 inhibitors يعني um, they are the safest hypoglycemic drugs that we have احنا شفنا دكتور محمد حسنين تفضل وقال قولوا لي ايه هو الدواء اللي سعره معقول طبعا PPP4 inhibitor يعني كان بيقول الاوبتيمم دراج بتاع السكر الدواء سعره معقول PPP4 inhibitors يعني they are not the least uh, من حيث الكوست ولكن سعرها بقى كويت افوردبل جدا يعني دلوقتي uh, لانها من الحاجات اللي ما زادتش في الفتره الاخيره طيب uh, effective they are effective they are not as potent as sulfonylureas but they are very effective drugs We're weight neutral they are weight neutral ممكن I don't think they will help you lose weight but they are weight neutral um, and so so they are quite uh, um, ideal drugs by any killer They are very safe for the 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 killer up to dialysis. طبعا في drug dose adjustment. The builder Lipton we have a study on if I need dialysis we use 25 to 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 50 milligrams per day for the need dose. The high acid Lipton command is quite safe in those patients. We we do have studies on it. They are both quite safe. We we just use them at half. To 25% of the usual uh, dose. Okay. لما بتيجي دائما تصير ال DPP4 inhibitors نسمع على دواء اسمه لينا جلبتن اللي بينقذ العيانين من مشاكل الكلى ليه؟ لأنه ملوش renal adjustment. إحنا كدكاترة كلى كلمة ملوش renal adjustment ما بت يعني ما 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 بنحبهاش قوي يعني لان احنا بنحس ان انا ايه الدواء اللي ليه رينال ادجستمنت اف ات از ا سيف دراج ثاني لو انا بستخدم دواء سيف وليه رينال ادجستمنت ده حاجه بعتبرها ميزه لاني بدي العيان جرعه اقل من الدواء فبكلفه فلوس اقل وبجيب الايفكت اللي انا عايزها فلما تقول لي ان انا اقدر ادي العيان جرعه كامله من الدواء او نص الجرعه من دواء ثاني والاثنين هيجيبوا نفس الافكاسي ونفس السيفتي اكيد هدي له الدواء اللي فيه رينال ادجستمنت علشان اوفر عليه فلوس يعني فحكايه الرينال ادجستمنت دي ما بت ما بت ما بتدخلش علينا قوي طيب الحاجه الثانيه اصله بي بروتكت ذا كيدنيز ذيس از ون اوف ذا بيجست لايز ان 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 ميديسن الحقيقه ذا ستادي ذات ذي هاف ذات ذي هاف يوزد مينلي تو بروموت ذيس الدواء ده دواء سيركاس الستادي اسمها الكارميلينا ستادي ويتش از ا ستادي ذات واز مينلي ديزاينت Uh, علشان تشوف uh, 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 cardiovascular endpoints في عيانين السكر وكان ليها secondary endpoint انها تشوف 
a secondary endpoint of end stage renal disease or reduction to GFR or renal death. والحقيقه لم يتمكنوا من تحقيق هذا السكندري اند بوينت وكان عندهم 17 tertiary composite end point ثانيه including different levels of GFR و chronic kidney disease و death و proteinuria ولم يتم تحقيق اي حاجه يبقى دي 18 اند بوينت فشلوا في تحقيقها وبعدين 15 اند بوينت اسمها single اند بوينتس exploratory اند بوينتس كلها صحيح pre specified ولكن كانت كلها exploratory اند بوينتس ولم يتمكنوا من تحقيق اي واحده فيهم ولا حتى انهم يقللوا البروتينوريا اللهم الا انه يغير الكاتيجوري بتاعت البروتينوريا which is a very very funny definition of البروتينوريا والحقيقه لو دخلنا في تفاصيلها انا مش عايز اضيع وقت بس كتير في الكلام على الدواء ده بس I can tell you very safely that this is not the drug that can protect or prevent العيان من الكيدني ديزيز لان انا كتير قوي بشوف لما عيان بيبقى متابع معايا او ليتس سي بياخد فيلدا او سيتا او وات ايفر بليكتن وبعدين يروح لحد لا يروح شايله قال له ايه ده ازاي بتاع الكلام ما خدش باله كتب لك اللينا جليكتن الحقيقه هو احنا لما بناخد بالنا بنشيله ما بنحطوش فلينا جليكتن از جاست انذر دي بي بي 4 انهبيتور ات از نوت ذا دراج تو يوز تو بريفنت او تريت كرونيك كيدني ديزيز ربما يكون لي ا فيري فيري مينيمال ديسبيوتابل ان كونفيرم افكت على البروتينوريا لمن يصر عن الدفاع عنه ولكني لا ارى انه من الاستدي بتاعت الكارميلينا دي يستحق ان يتكتب يعني. امال ايه الدواء بقى اللي احنا بنحبه اللي ساكن جوه قلب دكاتره الكلى ودكاتره السكر ودكاتره القلب الميتفورمين. طبعا اتس ا دراج ذات هاز بين شون تو ريديوس الاند بوينتس بتاعت العيانين بتوع الدايابيتس ماكرو فاسكولار ومايكرو فاسكولار وديث اند سو اون. فاتس اتس افكت is independent of the blood sugar control وبيقلل المورتاليتي بتاعت العيانين بتاعت الكرونيك كيدني ديزيز سبيسيفيكلي في 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 الدايابيتيك كيدني ديزيز بيشنتس طب ليه سمعته وحشه سمعته وحشه بسبب اخوك كبير اللي هو اسمه الفينفورمين فينفورمين ده الدواء اول اول بايكوانايت طلع وكان دواء بيعمل لاكتيك اسيدوزز وهو اللي شنك لاخوه وقعه كده وفضلت السمعه الوحشه ووصمه العار بتاعت الفينفورمين لازقه على الميتفورمين هل الميتفورمين دواء بيعمل لاكتيك اسيدوزيز الحقيقه الحقيقه عايز اقول لا بس مش هقول لا هقول اكستريملي رير أه وهقول انه تقريبا كل الحالات almost all the cases of reported lactic acidosis toxicity في العيانين اللي بياخدوا ميتفورمين كان بيبقى عندهم another cause للاكتيك اسيدوزيز تعالوا نبص على الارقام علشان برضو احنا اصل انت لو ما اديتش متفورمين ما انت هتدي العيان ايه؟ لو عيان بياخد متفورمين ليتس سي ودي بي بي 4 انهبيتور وما فيش فايده هتدي له ايه؟ يا سلفونايل يوريا يا انسولين في الغالب. تعالوا نتفرج على المتفورمين المتفورمين اسوسيتد لاكتيك اسيدوزيس بيحصل في سته من كل 100000 عيان كل سنه. المورتاليتي ريت في دول هيبقى النص يعني ثلاثه من وصف ال 100000 هيتوفوا طبعا كتير. تعالوا نبص على هايبوجلايسيميا هايبوجلايسيميا ال 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 incidence of hypoglycemia مع السلفونيل يوريز بقى لما نقارنهم باخواتهم السلفونيل يوريز الناس بتجري عليها ال ال hypoglycemia is about 1% mortality rate of about 4.3% من ال 1% في دول يعني هيموت حوالي 43 واحد من 100000 يس من ال severe hypoglycemia يس وي سي وي سي patients with chronic kidney disease with severe hypoglycemia all the time بس I have not really seen any any patient with lactic acidosis مع الميتفورمين الا اذا كان دايما بيبقى فيه سبب تاني. There is almost always سبب تاني. كنت لسه بقول المحاضره دي في وسط مجموعه من النفرولوجيستس وحد قال لي وقال لي لا بقى انا شفتها في عيان لا كان عنده سبسس ولا عنده هايبوتنشن ولا كان عنده اي حاجه خالص وخد ميتفورمين وبعديها بيومين جالنا المستشفى على الاي سي يو بلاكتيك اسيدوزيس. قلت له ليه بس ازاي حصل الكلام ده في الاخر بعد ما قعدت اجيبه واودي فيه طلع ان هو عيان كانوا عارفين من الاول ان عنده فاميليال مايتوكوندريال ديزيز بيعمل لاكتيك اسيدوزيز وهم اللي ادوا له الميتفورمين حاجه ميتفورمين لوحده كده يعمل هايبوجلايسيميا از اولموست ان هيرد اوف حاجه نادره جدا 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 وعلى فكره اللي عايز اقوله لكم بقى انه عيانين السكر عموما حوالي سته من كل 100000 بيجي لهم لاكتيك اسيدوزيز اصلا من غير ما ياخدوا ميتفورمين افري يير. طب والانسولين؟ لا الانسولين بقى احتمالات انه يحصل سيفير فيتال هايبوجلايسيميا معاه ضعف السلفونايل يوريز. ميتفورمين از ا فيري سيف دراج. 
طيب يجي السؤال اللي بعد كده بقى اللي دايما ايه العيان يروح ويرجع يقول لي آه رحت لحد وقال لي الميتفورمين ده انا هوقفه لك ما اعرفش ازاي دكتور الكلى كاتبه لك ده نفروتوكسيك الحقيقه اتس نوت نفروتوكسيك ميتفورمين ما اعرفش شفت الفيلم ده ولا لا لما كان الليمبي مصر يقول لعم بخ انت بابا مات ابوك مات مات مقتول ازاي يا يا عم بخ قال له 100 مره ابويا ما ماتش مقتول يا لمبي متفورمن والله العظيم از نوت ان افروتوكسيك دراج ات از نوت ان افروتوكسيك دراج طيب هل معنى كده انه ات از ان اكستريملي سيف دراج ناثينج از اكستريملي سيف ناثينج از بيرفكت الحقيقه انه ليه دوز ادجستمنتس لو هنبص على ال 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 جايد لاينز وهنمشي جنب الحيطه جايد لاينز اخيرا الحمد لله يعني رضيت علينا وبعد ما كانت بتقول كرياتينين 1.3 اقصى حاجه بقت دلوقتي بتقول جي اف ار 30 لكن لو عايزين نبص بقى على الريال داتا بقى اللي موجوده في الستاديز اللي موجوده عندنا في الجورنالز بتاعت النفرولوجي بقى لها 100 سنه وكل يوم وي جيت مور اند مور اند مور اند مور نيو ستاديز ات از سيف اب تو جي اف ار اوف 15 اتس ايفن سيف ان بيشنتس اون دياليسيز We do not use it for the animal غسيل. بس عايز أقولكوا إنه الحقيقة في داتا إنه it is safe. ولكن بعد ما يتعمل دوز adjustment طبعاً. فالمهم يعني لو العيان G F R بتاعه أكتر من خمسة وأربعين بنتي جرام ونص maximum أكتر من ثلاثين أقل من ثلاثين عفوا يعني عفوا لغاية ثلاثين ممكن جرام من خمستاشر بثلاثين G F R مستخدم خمسمية ميلي جرام بس if you are not going to be One of those who like to stick to the guidelines, and if you like to look at more evidence on the two guidelines, you can go down to a GFR of 15. Below 15, I would not suggest that it be used. I recommend in fish weight data, it pool in it is safe. I mean, it's PD with hemodialysis. I'm not saying we use it, but I'm saying that if you see someone who wrote about the Iran Gasil with dose 250, that's not a doctor. That's a doctor in the wrong field. And I'm saying, of course. لما عيان يبقى بياخد ميتفورمين ويجي له سبسس او يخش الاي سي يو اتس فيري وايز تو ستوب ات لان ده كده بيزود جدا الريسك فعلا ان يجي له سيريس لاكتيك اسيدوسيس. طيب في دواء جديد بقى اختراع جديد جميل جدا جدا يعني مبسوطين احنا منه جدا في النفرولوجي كوميونتي وي ار فيري اكستاتيك اباوت ات اسمه الاس جي تي 2 انهبيتورز الحقيقه دي ادويه جديده حضراتكم عارفينها طبعا شفنا بيها فيري يوزفول هارد وانترميديت اند بوينتس في عينين الكلى والسيفتي بروفايل بتاعها از كوايت ري اشورينج مش هنتكلم على فايدتها في عينين القلب وفي الهارت فيلير اند سو اون ولكن الحقيقه ات هاز شون دوز دراجز يعني في داتا من الديكلير ستادي مثلا على استخدام الدافاجليفلوزن انتروديوسز The composite endpoint of production of GFR with death or end-stage renal disease. And if you think that the lena glipton may never be able to do it, the reality it reduces the GFR, the endpoint of the end-stage reduction of GFR or end-stage renal disease or renal death. And the reality every single endpoint, any thing that you are looking at with an SGLT2 inhibitor, for example, almost always has to be achieved. Not just with the dafagliflozin, but in reality, of course. مع كمان الكالا ومع الامباج فلوزن الجميل بس في في الصوره دي اللي انا حاططها انها بتوري انه غالبا العيانين اللي بيستفيدوا من ال تي بي بي من الاس جي تي 2 انهبيتورز في انه يقلل البروجريشن في ديزيز هم العيانين عندهم بروتينوريا وعلى فكره اغلب الستاديز دي كان العيانين بياخدوا الماكسيمم توليرابل دوز من الاي سي انهبيتور او انجيوتنسيل ريسبتور بلوكر اتس ا دراج تو بي يوزد فور نيفرو بروتكشن اون توب اوف الريست بلوكر طيب لما بتكلم مع اصدقائي من دكاتره السكر بلاقيهم بيزعلوا قوي لما بكتب الدواء ده يقولوا لي ده دواء خيبان ما بيقللش السكر ولو كتبت العيان انا هوقفه لانه انا عايز اظبط السكر وانت حاطط لي دواء ما بيظبطش السكر الحقيقه انه هو فعلا في العيانين اللي عندهم كيدني ديزيز كل ما الجي اف ار بيقل كل ما الافيكاسي بتاعته بتقل السيفتي اتس ا سيف دراج الافيكاسي بتقل بس انا مش بكتبه از ان انتي دايبيتيك دراج ام جوينج تو سي ات اجين وي ار ناو يوزنج ات As a drug for the kidneys, even in non-diabetic patients, in the data that follows the non-diabetic patients with kidney disease, my advice is is very reassuring. And the fact is that the data that follows from the Credence study and the data CTD study is quite it shows that the drug is still effective for nephro protection and cardio protection. So, in fact, 
حتى لما الجي اف ار يقل تحت 30 فالكلام القديم بتاع ما تكتبوش الا لو الجي اف ار فوق 45 ده كلام ايه ده من حقيقه لا واحنا بنستخدمه لما الجي اف ار يكون فوق 30 وبنكمل بي لغايه لما يوصل ل 15 او ايفن اب تو دايالسيس فيري 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 سيف فيري they seem to be very useful drugs في ال ال from an epiprotective point of view. نمرة 11 ال GLP-1 uh, receptor uh, uh, agonists في ال chronic kidney disease uh, they are all usable they some of them need drug dose adjustment ال ال liraglutide بالذات كان uh, cardioprotective أو بيقلل ال atherosclerotic cardiac disease في العيانين اللي عندهم kidney disease كمان يعني diabetics with kidney disease ف it's probably Uh, the drug of choice if you're going to use those drugs في uh, عيانين الكلام. أخيرا إمتى النفرولوجيست عايز يشوف بقى عيان السكر اللي عنده مشاكل في الكلى؟ الحقيقة لو هيتعمل له العيان إحنا ما بنبقى إحنا بنبقى عايزين العيان كنفرولوجيست يبقى مع الدايبيتولوجيست بتاعه لأن هو اللي هيقدر يمانج الأوتكمز والجلايسيميا بشكل أحسن. ولكن بنبقى دايما عمالين بنلح على الدكاتره في البرايمري كير والانترنست بليز 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 تشيك ذا جي اف ار اند دي البومينوريا كل سنه على الاقل للعيان بتاعك ولو سليمه قيسها تاني حتى لو العيان ما عندوش دايباتيك ريتيناتيكي وحتى لو العيان ما عندوش ايديما في الريتي مالهاش دعوه خالص مش لازم بل يعني مش لازم نستنى البلا لما يحصل يعني ليت اس تشيك ات قبل ما ايه البلا قبل ما هو ولو لقيت عند العيان اي حاجه ما تبعته ليش مش هعمل له اي حاجه اكتر من اللي حضرتك بتعملها الا لما الجي اف ار بتاعه يقل عن 30 لانه لما بيقل عن 30 بتحصل ابتدي يحصل اسيدوزس بقى وابتدي يحصل مشاكل سي تي دي ام بي دي وانيميا والثينجز ذات ار نوت جاست تريتد باورسين كالسيمات اور سوان الفا زي ما بنشوف ناس كتيره بتعمل ات بيكمز ا لونج ستوري ذات داز نيد كو مانجمنت الحقيقه ويز ا نفرولوجيست يو ويل اولسو نيد تو كو مانج ويز ا نفرولوجيست وين البروتينوريا از أو الـ blood pressure أو الـ rate of change بتاع الـ GFR كرياتين عمال بيعلى أو في هيماتوريا أو كاست أو الزلال out of proportion الضغط out of proportion الأمور شكلها مش 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 مريح يعني زي ما بيقول وبالتالي علشان نعمل هدنة مع الدكتور اللي كان زعلان مني قوي 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 في الأول اللي كان عشان عايز أكتب متفورمن لعيانين الكلى يعني خلينا نقول إنه متفورمن is the king متفورمن هو الدواء الملك لغايه دلوقتي في العيانين الدايابيتكس اغلبهم as long as it is being used wisely بproper adjustment بproper monitoring of the kidney function بproper كل حاجه everything has to be done wisely anything used unwisely is not going to be uh, good طبعا SGLT2 inhibitors هو الملكه بقى اللي جايه مع الملك يعني they are the new drug hypoglycemia uh, GLP uh, receptor Agonists are also uh, uh, probably, probably useful drugs for the outcomes. But it's a cardiovascular outcomes. And now, the 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 Uh, في 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 الـ في الـ uh, control of the glycemia سلفونايل يوريز هنسيب المواطنين السلفونايل يوريز يعيشوا uh, تحت الملاحظه الشديده جدا مع اعتبارهم خونه ممكن يعملوا مشاكل في اي وقت وطبعا uh, uh, لينا جليبتن uh, is just another TPP4 inhibitor please do not use it as a drug that saves the kidney because it is not thank you very much شكرا ليك دكتور محمد ودايما موضوع الكيدني بيعمل أسئلة كتيرة الحقيقة حضرتك جاوبت على جزء كبير منها طيب احنا في سؤال عن الدوز of metformin in hemodialysis patients الميتفورمين في عيانين الغسيل بصي هقول لحضرتك على حاجه يا دكتوره ايناس يعني علشان هو الاجابه لا ميتفورمين في عيانين الغسيل الاجابه لا لانه والا 
يعني في داتا انه ات از سيف ات دوز اوف 250 ملي جرام في داتا كثيره انه ات از سيف في عيانين الغسيل ات دوز اوف 250 ملي جرام بير داي ولكن يعني مش عارف اقولها هقولها بطريقه بلدي شويه يعني ما حبكتش يعني يعني ما يعني طيب بس لحد الغسيل وقف لحد جي اف ار 15 وكفايه يعني انما الحقيقه ان انا لو شفت حد كتبه العيان غسيل ببروبر دوز وشايف انه العيان مش حاصل له مشاكل وشايف ان الدكتور بتاعه عارف هو بيعمل ايه وجالي العيان ده فور سكند اوبينيون انا هقول له خليك ماشي على الدواء يو كان يوز ات ات ا دوز اوف 250 ملي جرام ان دياليسيس بيشنت بات بات اي سترونجلي سجست that it be stopped at a GFR of 15. في سؤال تاني is Novo Norm safe in CKG? Yes, it's, it's, uh, هو شبه ال شبه السلفونايل يوريز الشورت اكتنج uh, uh, يعني it's an efficient drug, it's short acting والهايبوجلايسيميا معاه قليلة وبالتالي yes, we can use it, yes, yes. طيب هو الحقيقه ان في اسئله كتيره للدكتور محمد حسنين بس احنا الدكتور محمد عندهم في دبي الوقت ساعتين زياده فهم عندهم قربت يعني بعد منتصف الليل في سؤال على التارجت هيموجلوب ان اي 1 سي وز هيموداليسيس اه ما هو احنا قلنا يا دكتور ايناس ان هو عيان الهيموداليسيس بس مشكلته آه انه فيري برون للهايبوجلايسيميا ومشكلته الثانيه انه الجلايكيتد هيموجلوبين از ا فيري ان اكيوريت ميجر اوف جلايسيميا كنترول في العيانين دول وبالتالي يعني احنا بنقبل ليفل اوف اراوند 7 تو 8 زي ما شفت الستاديز اغلبها المورتاليتي بتبقى اقل في الرينج بتاع 6 ونص ل 8 ونص بس يعني 7 تو 8 طيب سؤال تاني سي كي جي بيشنتس اون هيموداليسيس ويتش جروب اوف اورال انتي دايابيتيك دراجز تو ستارت ويز ارجع تاني زي ما حضرتك قلنا سي كي جي بيشنت سؤال زي ما حضرتك قلت كل ما العيان كل ما العيان يكون اصغر كل ما العيان يكون اصغر في السن كل ما هبقى عايز امشي ناحيه هايبو حتى ناحيه مور ستريكت كنترول للجلوكوز حتى لو هو عيان غسيل ولكن تاني هرجع اقول عيانين الغسيل ار فيري برون لهايبوجلايسيميا فيوجوالي 7 تو 8 از وات موست اوف اس وود اكسبت الا لو كان العيان كبير قوي في السن وفريل ولايبل انه يقع يدي له فراكشرز بنميل ناحيه ال 8 وال 8 ونص مشكله عيان الغسيل انه ذي ار فيري 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 برون ان هم يجي لهم هايبوجلايسيميا وان يجي لهم فولز وان يجي لهم فراكشرز وذي ار فيتال لما بيتكسروا فيعني الخلاصه انه الرقم از اراوند 7 تو 8 اقرب لل 8 في العيانين الكبار يعني. سي كي جي بيشنت اون هيموداليسيس ويتش جروب اوف اورال انتي دايابيتيك دراجز تو ستارت ويز؟ دي بي بي 4 انهبيتورز يعني ذس از ذا ايزيست كويستشن دي بي بي 4 اون هيموداليسيس بس بس يتظبط لهم الدوز يا دكتور محمد؟ يس yes. طبعا بعد ما يعمل دوز ادجستمنت بعد دوز ادجستمنت البيلدا جليبتن الدوز بتاعته از 25 تو 50 ملي جرامز والسيتا جليبتن از 25 تو 50 برضه في عيانين الغسيل يس طيب احنا طبعا بنشكر حضرتك جدا هو في اسئله كتير وفي اسئله كمان للدكتور محمد واسئله ليا ولكن طبعا احنا لسه عندنا محاضره هنسعد بيها جدا مع الاستاذه الدكتوره جميله نصر أستاذة الدكتورة جميلة نصر is professor of cardiology Swiss Canal University general secretary of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology president of the preventive working group Africa vascular disease prevention uh, professor Gamila Mnawarona Nharda Uh, very eminent lady cardiology ومحبوبه من الجميع لازم اقول الكلام ده حضرتك منوره انا متشكره لحضرتك جدا ودايما ببقى سعيده جدا تشير مع حضرتك والحقيقه كل ما بيبقى فيه يعني ميتنج ببقى بتاع بتكوني حضرتك عاملاها بنكون متاكدين انها ناجحه 
وإليجنت كمان آه يعني احنا هنتكلم النهاردة على الكارديك ريسك ان ديابيتكس ويعني احنا هنتكلم على حاجات بسيطة جدا ان يعني لما بنقول على كارديو فاسكولار ديزيز اند ديابيتس ذا فولوينج ستاتستكس سبيك لاوت طبعا في سترونج كورليشن بين كارديو فاسكولار ديزيز اند ديابيتس ات ليست 68% اوف بيبل اوف ايج 65 او ييرز اور اولدر وذ ديابيتس داي فروم ا فورم اوف هارت ديزيز 16% داي اوف ستروك It is uh, adults with diabetes are two or four to four times more likely to die from disease, uh, heart disease than those without diabetes. And of course, the American Heart Association considers diabetes to be one of the major controllable risk factors for cardiovascular uh, disease. Um, what about the Egyptian male patients? And uh, we have 47% of Egyptian male patients and 69 patients of female presented with acute coronary syndrome are considered premature access causes. So in the Egyptian population, we're facing a really big problem that our patients are much younger and this we have to consider very much. And still we do have in, in another study that we do ha not have achievable goals like for some dyslipidemias and other things. We know that the uh, total deaths from cardiovascular disease in Egyptians, the non-communicable diseases are estimated to account for 85% of total deaths. And still the ischemic heart disease is number one killer, uh, both on men and females. Uh, what about glycemic control, evolution over time? If actually in the year 2000, more or less before 2008, Hemoglobin 1C was the, you know, the lower, the better. But after that, in this year, it said that the lower, the better, but without weight gain and hypoglycemia and side effects. What about 2018 and, and more? Uh, they consider the managed total cardiovascular risk by including glucose control with agents of proven safety and preventive efficacy. So the preventive strategy has become a very important item. Uh, you can see what is diabetes. As all know, that is a chronic condition that's characterized by raised blood glucose levels, hyperglycemia. But if you think about a uh, 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 cardiologist, maybe we have a different de definition. It's just to say type two diabetes is a condition of premature cardiovascular complications in the setting of chronic hyperglycemia. This may be considered a definition for the cardiologist. Of course, we are, the world is a, it's a huge growing uh, problem and the cost to society is very high and it's creating and we, maybe by the year 2035, maybe this number will rise to more than 592 millions, which is a really a big problem. And, uh, we should think of that very important. Uh, what about the Mr. Fit impact of diabetes on cardiovascular mortality? You can see the huge difference between diabetics and the non-diabetics. Uh, the number of risky factors, again, is very important to be considered for the difference between the diabetics and the non-diabetics. So cardiovascular disease is responsible for 80% of mortality in diabetic patients. And what are, about the UKPD studies findings? Of course, it, it's risk reduction uh, uh, with 1% decline in annual mean. If you have really, you know, uh, it, it, it decreases the microvascular disease, it decreases the peripheral vascular disease, the MI, the stroke, the heart failure, and the cataract as well. So we have to think of that very important. Um, again, the United Kingdom prospective diabetes study, it was found that if you, uh, you know, if you, the hemoglobin 1C, uh, the, there occurred 2000 events, it's, if it is less than 6%, uh, uh, actually, we had around 2.3 heart failure events per 100 person per year. But if it is more than 10%, it may be 
it's extremely much more and accounting for 11.9 heart failure events per 100 person per year. Um, so this is very important. And we have, of course, many, many resources for diabetes. Decades of study have defined numerous potential factors that each contribute to the disease susceptibility progression, and we should look for that. So we do have different stages, different phenotypes, different treatments for different uh, uh, factors. And of course, it is a really independent factor for heart disease. So two thirds of patients with established uh, cardiovascular disease have impaired glucose hemostasis. It affects 30% of heart, heart failure patients. Of course, so that we know every 1% increase in the glycosylate hemoglobin leads to an 8% increase in heart failure. This is very alarming. And the prevalence of heart failure in general population 1.4 and 1 to 4% and diabetics is 15%. So we have to look how it is enormously, uh, you, know, uh, you know, decreasing the mortality in the general population. What about in diabetes? If you are talking about cardiovascular disease in diabetes, uh, we do have some different aspects for the coronary vessels, endothelial dysfunction, uh, the increased arterial stiffness, the calcification of the coronaries, the accelerated atherosclerosis, and also there is an impact on autonomic nervous system with reduced heart rate variability, increased resting heart rate, which is very alarming, arrhythmia, impaired the coronary vasomotor uh, capacity and the cardiac muscle, leading to the systolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction. So we have different aspects of impact. All this dilemma of diabetes, hyperglycemia, it, it, at the end leads to our very alarming a complication of heart failure. What about the, uh, the diabetic cardiomyopathy? And we're talking about it is a distinct entity characterized by the presence of abnormal myocardial performance or structure in the absence of epicardial uh, coronary blood disease. Um, and actually, this is very important. It's a, a cardiac diabetic cardiomyopathy is a cardiac dysfunction, which affects approximately 15% of diabetic patients leading to overt heart failure and sudden death. How diabetes contribute to myocardial dysfunction in particular? Actually, we do have molecular substrate in, uh, substrate in diabetes. It causes hyperglycemia significant functional alteration to the cellular uh, sodium calcium ionic channel. It decreases the extrapolation and the increased in, intracellular concentration of ionic calcium it actually leads to this function of cellular sodium potassium channel, increasing the sodium sodium intracellular sodium and uh, increase intracellular calcium in cardiac myocytes. So can we see it's uh, uh, really the diabetic cardiomyopathy is a mild uh, myocardial interstitial fibrosis stained in blue and mesenchymal from white arrow in a patient with long-standing duration type 2 diabetes at autopsy with perivascular fibrosis. Of course, also we have the gene expression. As we can see, there is enhanced myocardial gene expression for muscle carnitine, uh, and we have down regulation. So it's actually the gene expression is uh, encountered in patients having diabetic cardiomyopathy, maybe there is some anatomical damage of the myocardial substrate, uh, maybe this atheroma, more extensive, more diffuse, pathologic alteration of small coronary vessels and myocardial endothelium, including increased the cell adhesion, adhesiveness, and impaired relaxation. So we do have really different mechanisms uh, uh, you know, uh, the hyperglycemia, free fatty acids, the insulin resistance, and all these lead to vasoconstriction, inflammation, thrombosis, which all diabetic hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, inflammatory cytokines, all these lead to abnormal metabolism, 
to uh, glycate, uh, you know, glycated end products and all these lead to many, many, many abnormalities for apoptosis, for cardiac uh, dyshemostasis, the uh, lipotoxicity, and so all these are leading to abolished preconditioning, which is very important for the cardiac muscle, cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy, beta adrenergic signaling pathway dysfunction, and many other abnormalities. These are the, the hidden mechanism of diabetic cardiomyopathy. We do have altered insulin signaling uh, for many, having many, many, many pathophysiologic aspects as well. Um, diabetic cardiomyopathy is a consequence of metabolic disorders, and all these lead to hypertrophy, and dilatation, and this leads to systolic dysfunction, and the ending, unfortunately, to fibrosis with lipotoxicity and loss of the cardiac cells, which is really very alarming. Phenotyping is, is very important, and it is different in the restrictive versus the dilated phenotype. So we do have phenotype differences in diabetes. How to diagnose this early cardiac dysfunction in preclinical settings? How, how it actually, it is not an efficient or easy task to detect the preclinical detection, which is very important methodology. But uh, we do have why, because molecular mechanisms are not fully elucidated, it remains Again, it remains asymptomatic for many years. It has comorbidities frequently coexist. Um, so how can we diagnose diagnosis of currently diabetic cardiomyopathy by exclusion of known risk factors for heart failure? So physicians actually should rule out the other potential causes of symptoms. The underlying specific pathophysiologic mechanism are, however, is really unknown. Could look for screening for asymptomatic patients. Look for the routine cardiovascular screening is not recommended. And treatment of risk factors is the focus. Look for the overt cardiovascular disease. You can consider some drugs. We can consider these. We can use aspirin. We can use statin. Uh, you can use uh, maybe beta blockers and metformin again, as we can see. Uh, of actually in, in a stable heart failure, we may use metformin in the presence of normal in, and avoid metformin in unstable patients. The clinical context of these patients, depending upon the duration of diabetes, exclusion of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and uh, you know uh, the glycosylated hemoglobin, other risk factors, patient uh, uh, age as well. Uh, we do have actually cardiovascular risk factors, which is specific for diabetes. It is very important to the, the, the cardiologist. This is the microalbuminuria, the massive proteinuria, the abnormal platelet function, the fibrinogen levels, the uh, serum insulin, the, uh, the thrombosis ability, and actually you can do a sting ECG. We can do stress ECG if it can detect uh, the, the resting ECG, can detect sinus tachycardia, look for the, uh, the QT length interval, look for the altered heart rate variability, uh, look for the QT variability, because if you are looking for the QT variability, this means that your, your myocardium is unstable and the, the patient may develop, uh, you know, uh, some premature ventricular ectopics, look for the exercise testing, Look for, for the cardiac autonomic function analysis. Look for the resting heart rate. A screen for silent ischemia by a stress ECG, resting ECG, stress testing, perfusion imaging. And this is the patient actually having some important basal left ventricular hypertrophy. And we can use a dimensional echocardiography, to, which is shown to increase the wall thickness and the left ventricular hypertrophy even in pre-diabetic stages, and look for the diastolic functional changes by echo is very important as well. And look for the diastolic dysfunction, which is found in 40 to 75% in diabetic patients, which is very important. Maybe we can use the advanced techniques for echocardiography, maybe the tissue Doppler analysis. We can look for the, uh, the EA ratio. So we do have many parameters. 
many advanced echo techniques for the diastolic dysfunction. Uh, we can look for the presence, presence and severity of diastolic dysfunction, and we can use many techniques. Actually, it was found that in these patients, if you look at that echo, and we have even uh, some uh, mitral valve affection with valvular diseases, it's, it's actually it's present in 32%, and it increases the mortality. So, so this is very important. And as we can see that, the, because the left ventricle becomes more spherical. And as we can see, this is a form of mitral regurge, which is found, and it, it indicates significant diastolic dysfunction. We can look for the new advanced techniques, strain, the reduced myocardial strain. Maybe there was, us, we conducted a study looking for the preclinical, in, in the pre-diabetes, we found that there is some uh, perfusion defects indicating ischemic changes in those patients having uh, ischemic heart disease. And we can see that there is perfusion defects in these patients, which is very important. <coughs> what about the guidelines? 2019, it showed that there is risk enhancing factors for clinician patient risk in discussion. One of them is the metabolic syndrome, which is one of its more important items of it is the increased with circumference and actually the triglycerides and the <clears throat> elevated glucose as well. We have to spot up on prevention and look for the some of the uh, physical, uh, you know, some risk factors for developing the, uh, actually, the, 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 luckily we have the risk factors for all chronic diseases are all the same. And one of this important is there's no physical activity. And actually in Egypt, it is considered one of uh, the, uh, those nations in the uh, Arabian countries to have low physical activity, which is, should be considered very important. So uh, very interesting uh, slide. That uh, there is a subway a ticket machine in Moscow accepts the 30 squats as its payment. So exercise is important to, as a, an important way to improve to, to a, a preventive tool. This is an excellent way of uh, uh, using technology. It's a good use of technology. On the other hand, in the pizza, this is a bad, poor use of technology. So please, uh, you should shorten time, get active 10 uh, minutes, uh, three times a, a day for prevention. Look, physical activity and diet are important regardless of weight. So should attain a desirable weight isn't enough to be healthy. So we have to look for the uh, physical activity as well as diet. Uh, obesity and life expectancy is really important in Framingham study. And we found that the obese smoker lives 14 years less than normal. The obese at 40 years, less six to seven years than normal. And of course, we have to adopt uh, an exercise, uh, you know, pro based program. And we can, for example, tell your, pa your uh, uh, patient to uh, take stairs. This will uh, take around 19. Uh, calories to be burned and not use the lift, which just, uh, you know, consumes only three calories per half an hour. Tell your lady, the, the, the wife, the, 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 the wife to cook the meal uh, for in the house, this will consume around 70 calories, where order takeaway, it just will consume one calorie. Please, you should move more and more. This will prevent all the chronic diseases in diabetes, in, in, in ischemic heart disease patients. Avoid the sofa. The sofa, please, the, this is solid fats, added sugars, which is very important. So the healthcare system, the iceberg phenomena, the self-care, we can present 80, prevent 80% 80 of the problem. And before uh, trying to get the professional care, which is actually 20% for the primary, for the secondary, for the tertiary, and before we can see that this is the future of prevention, that is, of course, the lifestyle changes, the, uh, the, 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 the drug therapy, 
take care that the drug therapy, there is a future innovating targets if in different aspects for the hypertension, the, the hyperglycemia, the dyslipidemia, maybe have the, uh, to improve, this is the preventive case based strategy in, uh, in, in patients to, in type two diabetes, to in cardiovascular events. What about the COVID-19 era, effects of hypertension, diabetes, and coronary heart disease? All say that the conclusion, this is the meta-analysis conducted, you know, maybe a few days ago, and it showed that the uh, hypertension, diabetes, and the coronary disease can affect the severity of COVID-19. It is related to the imbalance of this in, in, in converting enzymes and the cytokine storm induced by the metabolic disorders. Do we need a change? Yes, we have to establish a culture of healthy living. We have to set the goals for the sustainable development goals, where the health, the keeping health is number three. We have to adopt this very nice equation of the European Society of Cardiology for prevention. This is in the former equation, 0351 What does that mean? Zero stands for no tobacco. You should walk three kilometers a day or 30 minutes, any moderate activity. You have to take five portions of fruits and vegetables. You have to, uh, of course, if he's diabetic, we should take care of that uh, to take not uh, a big amount of fruits and blood pressure should be less than 140. Five, three stands for uh, the dyslipidemias. Zero stands for avoidance of overweight and uh, and uh, overweight and obesity and diabetes. So uh, diabetes here is integrated in the equation of the European Society of Cardiology as a real important uh, risk factors. So the end is the greatest wealth is health, and this is we need all according to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs to uh, be. Uh, uh, be able to achieve, to be responsible, and we hoping the best for uh, our country. And thank you very much. Professor Gamila, Hadritik Taban Sharafchina, wa shukran احنا بنشكر حضرتك على النجاح الكبير للميتنج ده وان شاء الله يعني نتمنى دايما لحضرتك التوفيق في كل ايفنت حضرتك بتعمليه ميرسي هو طبعا يمكن عدد الحضور النهارده غير مسبوق بسبب طبعا وجود حضراتكم احنا عندنا النهارده اكثر من 420 ده كان اخر رقم اتبلغته يمكن يكونوا زادوا دلوقتي الاسئله داخله في بعض مش عارفه ليه في ناس طيب في في سؤال بقى مهم قوي بالنسبه لوجود حضرتك كقامة كارديولوجي كبيره اخبار الاس جي ال تي 2 اي هل حضراتكم ابتديتوا تكتبوه في سؤال عليه هل حضراتكم ابتديتوا تكتبوه في نون دايابيتيك بيشنتس ولا لا وهل البيشنتس ده سؤال اللي هو 60 years old سيفتي أخبار حضرتك يعني هل من الحاجات تقدري تكتبيها دلوقتي من غير دايابيتس وهل حضرتك تقدري تكتبيها لـ 60 years of, of complications فاحنا لكن اوريدي الحقيقة كأن هي تبقى approved في non diabetic patients it is still we are awaiting the uh, you know uh, maybe the recommendations the guidelines إن هي تبقى تستخدم كأنتي فيلير باي باي إتس باي بير سي لكن وي هوب إن الفترة الجاية إن هي تبقى يوزد إن شاء الله لأنها إبروفد إفكاسي الحقيقة طيب إحنا هنا
احنا طبعا العيان الدايبيتك مشكلته طبعا زي ما احنا عارفين كلنا انه مشكلته انه هو ما بيبقاش بيجي بسيمتومز جاست المين برزنتيشن بتاعه بيبقى جاست ديسنيا فطبعا في بيشنتس كتيره جدا بتبقى مز العيان ده بيحتاج اجريسيف تريتمنت بيحتاج ان احنا بندي لو هنستخدم ستنس بنستخدم دراج لوتنج ستنس بنستخدم بيحتاج اجريسيف فورم اوف تريتمنت بتبقى كوستي فا اف وي كان بريفنت الاوكرنس اوف كومبليكيشنز ذيس ويل بي ا بريك ثرو في سؤال is there any special treatment for covid 19 in uh, cardiac diabetic patient Um, actually, in diabetic patients in COVID-19, can we claim that we have a problem with the ACE inhibitors? We talk about it a lot, and after that, the truth is that at the moment, the study, the meta-analysis, has shown that it is rather safe and may even have a protective, uh, you know, impact. But it's sure that in COVID-19 patients. لازم ندي العلاج بتاع العيان ولازم to be kept on his medications نخلي بالنا ان في في complications in new oral anticoagulation is very important والحقيقة الاسبكت بتاع النواك دلوقتي او new oral anticoagulation is really considered وmaybe ان احنا in some of these patients who are prone to develop Embolic manifestations. If uh, COVID-19 patients, we need to uh, know new oral anticoagulants maybe for mm -hmm. one month. And some studies recommendations say that we can even, uh, you know, uh, need for three months to give the new even after, uh, you know, uh, you know, the patient is fine and he's, uh, you know, is the COVID-19 era. Uh, even it in, uh, you know, uh, after uh, going home. So I think that uh, also uh, patients with COVID-19 encountered a very important, uh, you know, form of myocarditis. Um, failure of the heart, you can find this uh, dysfunction, it's a stolic dysfunction, there's stolic dysfunction in those patients. All we have to say, just to keep on in, in patients in medications, you can use his medications. It's very important to treat blood pressure. It's very important to give the new oral anticoagulations in many situations. Um. خليني في الآخر أشكر حضراتكم جدا. إحنا سهرناكو بشكر الأوجنس. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, Novartis, uh, the sponsoring uh, company. Taban Bashkur Asadzal Afadil, Professor Franz from Denmark, Professor Mohammed Hassanin from uh, Dubai, uh, Professor Gamila Nasr, uh, uh, eminent cardiologist in Egypt, uh, Professor Mohammed Nasrallah Zamili, uh, Professor of Nephrology in Cairo University. Um, طبعا بشكر بيور سبوت خليني افكر حضراتكم ان بكره في يوم تاني قوي جدا ومحاضرات جديده ونحب ان حضراتكم كلكم تبقوا متواجدين هنبتدي بكره الساعه 8 ان شاء الله في انتظار يا خبر سكر ده جاي منين ده؟ اعمل ايه بس واتصرف ازاي؟ وايه دي كمان؟ صحراء ملية؟ ده اللي جابها هنا دي اه ايه ده؟ انا بتسحب لا اسمع كويس يا بدري وشوف لقطات من مستقبلك يمكن تتعلم وركز في قرارك اللي هيحدد شكل حياتك ده هيبقى شكل حياتك مع مرض السكر ما تخافش افتكر انك ممكن تصلح كل ده دلوقتي قبل ما يفوت الاوان اول مشكله هتقابلك اهي شايف شكل عينيك عامل ازاي يا لطيف ايه اللي عنيا دي اهم حاجه فيا وكمان كليتك شايف شكلها وصل لايه يا ستير يا رب لا مش كليتي كمان حتى اطرافك يا بدوي شايف بقى صعب عليك حاجات كتير كنت بتعملها في يومك ايه انت بتقول ايه يعني قصدك عمري ما هعرف ده غير رجلك اللي ممكن توصل لقدر الله لكده لا 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 انا خارج من هنا مش هقدر اسمع تاني استنى بس 
جه الوقت اللي تشوف فيه حياتك الإيجابية اللي هتبقى حقيقية لو تعالجت بدري اطلع السلم من هنا وشوف دنيتك هتبقى ازاي يا فرج الله أخيرا هتحافظ على عينيك ونظرك هيفضل سليم أيوة يا سيدي قول كمان أما كليتك هتفضل زي ما هي سليمة وزي الفل يا سلام مفيش أحلى من كده وأطرافك كمان يعني هتعمل كل اللي انت عايزه أيوة كده طمنتني وهتقدر تتمرن براحتك وتجري برجلين سليمة وقوية أنا جاهز أبدأ حالا فعلا ابدأ حالا قبل ما يفوت الأوان ياه المستقبل شايل حاجات كتير ممكن تبقى كويسة أو ممكن تبقى صعبة بس خلاص أنا تعلمت الدرس وعرفت أنا محتاج أعمل إيه مساء الخير يا دكتور لو سمحت كنت عايز الدواء ده أصلا أنا قررت أبدأ بدري وغير حياتي للأحسن وهو ده الوقت المناسب ممنوع تاخد أجازة ما ينفعش تشتغل من البيت ممنوع تعزل نفسك مطلوب منك تختلط بالمرضى تستنى الخطر في كل لحظة لكل طبيب في مصر والعالم بيخاطر بسلامته وأمانه علشان حياة ملايين بيواجهوا خطر وباء كوفيد 19 كلمة شكرا مش كفاية احنا في نوفارد مش بس بنشكركم احنا معاكم بنشارككم ونشارك العالم كله بإسهاماتنا في جهود مكافحة كوفيد 19 عشان ننفذ التزامنا الدائم بتمكين ودعم المرضى مش احنا بس كل فرد في العالم بيدعمكم عشان تنجزوا مهمتكم كل واحد قرر يشتغل من البيت كل واحد بيحمي نفسه وغيره بالعزل الاختياري كل واحد بيتجنب الاختلاط كل واحد بيبعد عن اي مصدر خطر ولو محتمل كل واحد بيحافظ على العادات الصحية كل دول بيدعموكم وبيشكروكم وبيتمنوا لكم السلامة